And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello there, very good morning. Good to see you on this uh, Tuesday morning. It is the 9th of April and the time exactly now, 6 o'clock. You're very welcome to breakfast with Eamon and Holmes and Isabel Webster. The headlines this morning. New developments in the manhunt for Habiba Masoom, suspected of stabbing a woman to death in Bradford on Saturday. Mark White with the latest. Well, shocking developments in this case with the news from court documents that the prime suspect was on bail, having previously been charged with assaulting and threatening to kill the woman that he's now accused of stabbing to death in Bradford City Centre on Saturday afternoon. Millions across North America have turned their eyes to the sky to catch a glimpse of a rare solar eclipse. Labour has pledged to crack down on tax dodgers in a bid to fund new pledges for the NHS. We'll be speaking to the Shadow Financial Secretary, James Murray, just after seven. And our debate after seven o'clock today will be debating whether the Foreign Office is too elitist as former diplomats call for radical reform to the department. Good morning. There's wet and windy weather on the way for many today with rain and wind warnings in force. Find out all the details with me a little later on. Uh, before we get off and running, we just want to tell you that we've got a new way uh, for you to get involved in the show, which we uh, started yesterday, and uh, it'll take a while for everybody to get in touch with it, but uh, you will... Uh, gbnews.com forward slash your say. So that's uh, a website, gbnews.com and then forward slash your say to have your say on this very program yeah. and throughout the program. And this thank morning. you to all of you who had a go at the new system yesterday. Lots of you really enjoying the interactive tool in there. Have another go uh, if you've already tried. If you haven't, this is how you do it. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. OK, uh, we begin with the manhunt in Bradford this morning. Court documents revealing that the suspect in all of this um, was out on bail after making threats to assault and kill this woman. Yeah, and we understand uh, GB News has learned that this particular individual was in the UK after managing to get a student visa. Let's get all the latest from GB News's Mark White this morning. A few revelations there, then. 
Yeah, good morning to you both. Uh, some very serious and worrying developments in this case. The prime suspect is Habib Mansour, who is uh, Masoum, I should say, who is now on the run. He's described as extremely dangerous. The public have been warned not to approach him, but to dial 999 if they have any information on this prime suspect. Now court documents revealing that Masoum had appeared in court, Magistrates Court in Manchester, on the 27th of November, charged with uh, stabbing, uh, uh, charged, I should say, uh, with uh, making threats and also uh, with assaulting uh, this woman, Kulsuma actor, uh, on uh, a date just a couple of days before this. Uh, he pleaded not guilty uh, to those charges at that time. He was released on bail despite, we're told from court documents, prosecution um, objections to that. And now, of course, he is accused of going on uh, and stabbing this woman to death on Saturday afternoon in Bradford City Centre. This woman was out pushing a pram uh, with her young infant child and that the child was not harmed, but she was fatally stabbed uh, in this incident. We also revealed yesterday that Masoom had come to the UK uh, on a student visa, a Bangladeshi national. He'd arrived in the UK just over two years ago. Now, we're told that he is not an overstayer, that uh, he was still running uh, some time on that uh, student visa. Um, the Home Office not officially commenting on this, except uh, to say that any foreign national eventually convicted of a serious crime would be deported at the earliest opportunity. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll leave it there. Uh, well, let's turn to politics of the day. A big day for potentially future Chancellor Rachel Reeve. She's across a lot of the front pages of the newspapers this morning. Let's get the thoughts of former Chief of Staff to Nadim Zahawi. That is James Price, who joins us in the studio. Good morning to you. Morning. Um, look, she's had a tough job over the last four weeks or so, trying to uh, get her spreadsheets in order after Jeremy Hunt blew a hole in all of that with his non-dom shock um, announcement. So what have they come up with to try and pledge a, and, and, and fund a lot of the pledges they've made towards the NHS yeah. and schools? <clears throat> so there's a, there's a few different bits and bobs going on here with, with Rachel Reeves. As you said, in the budget recently, Jeremy Hunt uh, closed this idea of non-dom, so this idea that you can not be taxed on earnings that you don't have uh, outside the United Kingdom. The idea of this whole regime is to make sure that very wealthy people can come into the UK, can spend lots of money here, can invest here, can set up their businesses here, save in the knowledge that they're not going to be taxed on things that aren't happening outside the UK. I think it's a great system. Um, some people don't like it because it's lots of rich people coming in here, but actually for a long time it's meant lots of people coming I've read through. it being described as a sort of colonial hangover, which is always the <laughs> ultimate insult, isn't it, in, in the modern world. But as you say, the French did away with it, and then, guess what? All those wealthy people moved to London. Exactly. So there is that fear that that exodus could happen. But Jeremy Hunt's just taken the view, you know what, I'm just going to blow a hole in their, in their finances anyway. Right, exactly right, because this was a big Labour idea, so so, so the Tories have gone along and stolen it. So Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, has had to work out a few other bits of bobs. So one of these things is going to be closing some of the loopholes that she says exists in what the Conservatives have suggested. Um, other taxes, I think, coming in to, to help fund the NHS. The problem is that it's, it's so impossible to actually be able to work out how much this stuff will actually raise. Mm. You, you can always say, oh, well, it's going to raise X many pounds if you look at it in what you call a static way. But if you start looking at these things in, in what economists would call in a dynamic way, mm. which is to say, well, we have this effect here and then it will have have this effect and this effect all the way down the line because people's behaviour changes when incentives change and when other things change. You can't ever know how much this will raise. This is why in the 1980s when taxes went down, actually the amount of tax money that came in went up mm. because people stopped trying to hide their money, they stopped paying for expensive accountants and all these sorts mm. of things. But the National Audit Office have recently published uh, figures saying six billion a year could be recovered through an effort on tax avoidance specifically. So they've obviously decided this is going to raise them, what, uh, 
quite a lot of money to help them with, with these big pledges. Yeah, and, and, but again, I think with, with these things, it's, it's about this sort of headline figure. I think that the IFS, if we're trading, trading these different bodies back at you, I've said, well, we just don't really know. I think that there are two ways you can do this. You can throw more money at the problem. So you have HMRC hiring more people to investigate these things, or you could massively simplify the tax code. The tax code in Hong Kong, we're talking about colonial hangovers, it's about 130 pages or something. Here, 30 something thousand mm -hmm. pages. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly complicated. So if you're a great big business or a super wealthy person, mm -hmm. you can pay for an accountant who will help you move pots of money here and there and change things in different years, mm -hmm. stuff that the rest of us can't have. And of course, that's all just then a dead weight loss, which is money that therefore you're not putting on building your mm -hmm. business or looking after your family. So if we cut these taxes, if we simplify everything, it stops being worth mm -hmm. a while for people to hide this money around. Um, the irony, I suppose, in all of this about talking about tax avoidance is the pressure remains full square, doesn't it, on Angela Rayner, who, by some, is being accused of tax avoidance or, or capital gains. And of course, she denies this. But Keir Starmer coming out saying, look, he doesn't. He thinks it would be inappropriate to see her legal advice. But now the chairman of the Conservative Party saying, actually, this is going to tarnish your reputation, Keir Starmer. You need to take a stronger position on this. What do you think? It's really difficult, isn't it? The, the one bit of me wants to say, well, look, what happens in politicians' private lives is a private matter. Well, you did advise right? Nadine Zahawi. So right. Well, but you so, would so, say we, that. so let's. So then you say, well, hang on a minute. Is it worth having this person sticking around? So either you say, look, there's, there's zero tolerance and everybody in politics has to be absolutely whiter than white. Well, right? I think which if you're coming happens. out and announcing a package today which is going after people who are avoiding tax and then you're saying, well, you know what, we're going to just... You know, she's from the north as one of the excuses. Or, well, nobody's whiter than white. Well, how on earth can they put that out as a policy? It's double standard. It's hypocrisy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one defence was that she was a woman as well, which is a kind of a, a ridiculous kind mm. of soft bigotry of, of low expectations on these sorts of things. So either you take that every politician is whiter than white. Well, mm. all of your viewers will know that that isn't mm. true. Or do we say, well, hang on a minute, nobody's perfect, but is this person worth what they bring? So in the case of my old boss, Nadeem Zahawi, the guy ran the vaccine rollout, saved tens of thousands of lives, ran the Queen's funeral, right? And therefore, whatever other complicated things may have been happening, I think it's worth having that guy at the top of public mm -hmm. life. What is Angela Rayner most famous for? All I can remember is her shouting scum at her opponents across the House of Commons. Well, there we go. James Price, thanks very much thank indeed. You, thank you. Uh, let's get an update on other stories coming into the newsroom on this Tuesday morning. Uh, the Post Office Horizon Public Inquiry resumes today, almost four years after it began, with campaigner Alan Bates set to make his first appearance. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led to the Post Office wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in software. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron has met Donald Trump in Florida before holding talks with the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The two men discussed the war in Ukraine, NATO and the Middle East and it is the first summit between a senior government minister and the former president since he left office in 2020. Up to £11 million from water company fines will be reinvested in schemes to improve waterways and wetlands. Uh, the Water Restoration Fund which has now opened for applications, will offer grants to local groups, charities, farmers and landowners to help them improve rivers, lakes, streams and wetlands. And campaigners are calling for the government to ban 25 pesticides which contain so-called forever chemicals. Found in common UK fruits, vegetables and spices, the discoveries prompted alarm over potential impacts on public health. Out of all the items tested, strawberries were found to be the worst affected as 95% of the 120 tested samples contained these PFAs. Which are pesticide residues, as it turns out. Mm. There you are, today marking three years since the death of Prince Philip, uh, husband of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, the late royal died at the age of 99 at Windsor Castle and was the longest serving royal consort in history. And so incidentally, as we reflect on Prince Philip mm. today, and we'll be talking about that later in mm. the programme, if you have any um, Prince Philip memories, he was quite... Um, He's quite a character. Quite direct, quite a character. Last time I met him, 
He said, all this talk about climate change, everybody complaining, blooming good for the gross at Sandrine, I'm out tell you. <laughs> Much more gross. Oh, my goodness. Um, but just the fact that it's been three years, and when you think how much has happened since then, of course, he's died, and the late Queen Elizabeth II's passed away. He was the enforcer, all the health wasn't he? woes, um, obviously Harry and Meghan and all of that. It has been a turbulent, frankly, three years. So we'll be reflecting on that a little bit later on in the programme. Yeah. Uh, solar eclipse, if you get up to look at it in Britain, you won't have seen anything. Lots of clouds uh, covering things. But it could have lasted for over four and a half minutes, depending mm. where you were in the world. And that was mostly North America um, where it happened. Let's have a look at it. This uh, in the past few hours. Um, and there's basically what it um, looked like. So magical, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? sort of ring of fire in the sky. They're quite rare, aren't they, these total eclipses? Won't happen again, apparently, for another 20 years. Um, and Americans in typical sort of <laughs> American fashion were all whooping and crying. Did you see some of the scenes of the of the gathered crowds there. Um, you can see lots of sort of very American uh, reaction to all of that. Unfortunately for us, as Amy was saying, um, not so lucky with seeing uh, partial eclipse here in the UK because of cloudy weather. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that gets me is um, the president, the president of the most powerful country in the world, the United States, Joe Biden, has to come on with a public safety message. Don't look at the sun without, don't look at it directly and don't look at it without wearing glasses. What sort of morons are out there? I mean, he never they, takes his Ray Bans off anyway, does Biden? That's he doesn't very true. need to yeah, worry. So he, he'll be like that. But, um, um, yeah, well, but I suppose you have to. There are a lot of thick sitting. people in the world. <laughs> But there are a lot of thick people. Well, I'll tell you who's not thick. Mark Thompson, he's an astronomer. They are the cleverest of the clever. Good morning to you. Um, Good sort morning. of mind boggles sort of all of this. Um, I find space talk in general makes me feel really inconsequential and small and trying <laughs> to understand the science behind a total eclipse. Um, bring us up to speed on exactly what has been witnessed in the last few hours. Well, the, uh, the Earth goes around the sun uh, and the moon goes around the Earth. And every so often, they line up. It's as simple as that. And when we get the, uh, the moon passing in between the Earth and the sun, it, when we get a perfect alignment, there's a wonderful word that describes it called a synergy. Um, and when that happens, the moon blocks sunlight from reaching the Earth. You have to be in a very specific area on Earth to, to witness it. Um, and, of course, uh, yesterday and a few hours ago, people in North America and Mexico were lucky enough to uh, to witness the event, but they are quite rare, unfortunately. I think we've got another um, 50, 60 odd years to wait before we get to see another one in the UK. It's not a tourist attraction. It's not like a Disney attraction or whatever. Uh, I reckon it obviously gives scientists the chance to do things that they couldn't normally done. What sort of attention um, from the scientific community would have been on what happened last night? Well, one of the things we, we, we still don't understand too much about the sun, the uh, the outer thinner atmosphere of the sun called the corona um, is actually really, really hot. Of course, the sun itself is hot, um, but the corona seems to get hotter um, the further away from the sun it is. Um, so we don't fully understand quite why the corona seems to be heated up to higher temperatures than the, the visible surface. So um, when you get a solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, you actually block the bright photosphere, the, the really bright portion of the sun gets blocked out and you get to see um, that wonderful ring of fire um, which shows the corona and that gives you an opportunity to study it. Um, so we were certainly looking at that yesterday, trying to learn uh, and unlock some of the mysteries of it. Yeah, I was talking a little bit earlier in the intro about the reaction of the Americans, um, but the, the reaction of nature, very, very different and always fascinating. Just describe a little bit about the impact on, on birds, insects, wildlife when these events happen. Apparently go silent. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I was down in Cornwall in 1999 for the eclipse. You could see total eclipse in the UK. Um, and, and you talk about Americans getting carried away and whooping. Where I was, it was cloudy. You couldn't see anything. But even in the UK, we still whooped, which was a most bizarre experience. Um, but you're absolutely right. When, when you've got uh, just middle of the day and it goes dark, um, animals think it's got turned to nighttime. Um, and everything goes quiet. Um, cows often lay down during the uh, the moment of totality. But then when the sun comes out again, you get another dawn chorus. Um, and it was most peculiar. I forget what time it was back in 1999, but it was middle of the day, um, and we suddenly had this dawn chorus when the uh, the sun came out again. And it's most bizarre experience. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm presuming you didn't get a glimpse. There was nowhere near you locally that you were able to see anything. 
No, not at all. I live in Norfolk. We never get to see any clear skies here, unfortunately. <laughs> but you would have had to have travelled to the northwest of the country to try and get a glimpse of it just before the sunset. But I've not heard of anybody who saw anything from the UK because uh, plenty of cloud cover, yeah. unfortunately. But Isabel made a very good point there about how inconsequential she feels um, seeing the magnitude of, of something like this. It is quite humbling, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when, if you think about it, these sort of things, they happen, even if we're here or not. Um, the, the, the solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, they, they're not human. They're not here for humans. It's just a chance event um, that happens um, and we get to observe it. But you're right. If you, if you think too much about the stuff that goes on in the universe and you think about the sheer scale um, of the universe, you know, we've, we've discovered now over 5,000 other planets around other star systems. Um, and the more we learn about it, kind of the more inconsequential you feel. Um, but you've got to keep a, you know, keep a level head, and it's, it's uh, quite a fascinating world, uh, universe out there. Yes. Well, you keep doing the fascinating work that you do. Must be incredible being an astronomer, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the exciting nights for you guys last night. Thanks very much indeed, Mark, for your take on things. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, with all that, I don't know, it wasn't just cloudy where I was last night. We had those crazy winds again, uh, pouring with rain as I was driving in this morning. Some wild weather well, out never there Never mind still. that. That's inconsequential compared to that. Yeah. I mean, as he said, love is a burning thing. <laughs> Here we go. And it makes <laughs> a fiery ring. <laughs> Bound by wild desire. I fell into a ring of fire. I can't even go that low. That's what it was. That <laughs> it was, was a, a ring, ring of fire. fire. That's what you, you should be talking about today. How fiery was your ring <laughs> last night? Did you get to see uh, the eclipse anywhere? And then there's that other song, isn't there? Is it a, is it a total eclipse of, of the, the heart? The heart. Yeah, that one. Who sang that? Oh, God. Tun Tunya, someone or other, I don't, is it? Um, I'll, look, I'll look that one up. Um, yeah. Annie Shuttleworth with your forecast. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with a wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. Should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. weather map was depressing. Take a look at this because this great British giveaway will get you well yeah, out yeah, of yeah, here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're always Come on the I'll next thing. I was trying to make a link between no, well, this I'm and trying to inform you're people. Singing for me. This, this blooming thing we have about getting in touch today, yeah, yeah, yeah. which You'll nobody's say. using, yeah. nobody seems to understand it. So put this, so somebody explained to me, this is what a website. This is our website, gbnews.com. Yes. So you've got to log on as if you were... <laughs> So it's not it's not an email. 
It's not an it's email. It's a website. Yeah, it's a website. Right, so you go, you go on to Google or something and you put in gbnews.com forward slash your say. say. It would take you there. That brings you to our website. Then you go to the bottom of that page and you'll find the little portal where you can communicate. If you're a GB News member, your comments will be given priority because we're trying to encourage people to support us here at GB News. Yes, um, okay. And then so you can interact with each uh, other. The reason I'm bringing this up is that every day hundreds and thousands of people get in touch with us, but nobody's bothering anymore. No, so they, they don't are, understand this, despite... <laughs> Isabel's enthusiasm for all of this, no one understands how to use this, obviously. So I'm just trying to spell it out as plain and simply as I can for stupid people like me. <laughs> oh, right, okay, what, good. <laughs> what that is, right? Yeah, I don't necessarily think it's that people aren't getting it. I think it's more that, you know, it's a they new system it. and we're just, you know... People don't like change. So say. if you stick with things, the future, this is the future. We well, yeah, are because there is an the AI future. element to this as well. What, what, what? Well, I think there are some filters on there <laughs> because everything that's being sent in is viewed publicly and so I think that AI is being used to filter anything too abusive about you or me, for example. Oh, what a great. lot of I'm to tell you this. Oh, come see. here and I'll tell you. I was interviewed by a foreign language... Um, uh, publication oh, right, right. recently, right? Come on, tell me which. So basically, I'm not going to tell the you which. Right? So, no, so what they did was they then took my interview oh, no. and, and they put it through an AI interpretation thing. What a lot of... Did it come out mumbo-jumbo? Couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, but it. probably because you litter your language with all these Northern Irish kind Correct. of... Correct. Yeah. And they just could, they could not <laughs> translate it or understand Come here and it. Tell you. And they use words like paradigm, which I would never use, right? And, um, and then so they, they talked about... they you. And they talked about um, when I grew up on my farm, right, with my father and brothers who I were know, farmers. I know, I know. And I don't know where this came from. I so so what I, I don't know what has interpreted from my father being a carpet fitter into a farmer... <laughs> But, um... Well, you know, we talk... Well, you've talked a lot about stupidity this morning and, I, and everyone talks about AI as being this terrifying thing. Sometimes I actually think it's really, really stupid. Whenever yeah. I've used yeah. it, or well, yeah. ChatGPT or whatever, and I've Googled you or me, it's full of errors about us and our backgrounds. So I'm not convinced AI well, well, is as you see, clever as we all well, think. You see, I'm listed somewhere as having shot to fame by appearing in Inspector Morse. <laughs> Right. So I wish I had have appeared yeah. in Inspector Morse. Nonsense. But um, no, no. So honestly, there's such rubbish out there. You might as well make it all up, uh, which a lot of people seem to do anyway. Well, not on my watch. So but go. anyway, so we were talking so, about Isabel, that where weather were we? map. Where that were weather we? map that had this big sort of blue thing that looks like my dress moving across your screen, which yes. just basically is bringing misery to all of us. Well, forget about that. Misery. Because our British giveaway this time is more than just cash, £10,000 of cash, and it's more than just luxury travel items. It is the ultimate Greek cruise, worth £10,000. It's, well, it's so year. It's so lovely, we feel that we don't want to give it to you, <laughs> that we want to go Keep it ourselves. For ourselves. And, or at the very uh, least, uh, give uh, it to you out on location. Well, I think what we should do is, whoever wins it, mm -hmm. we should be posted with them I agree. to film their yes. experience on it. Show them it. Basically, don't listen to us, have a look at this. This is what it's all about. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. See what we mean? Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. That is the cruise of all cruises. We want to go. We're not allowed to enter, but you are, so make sure you do. And I've got... I would have everything ready for that. I'd have my tango briefs and everything. Sorry. Just ready... To, Your what? Ready to go... What? Your tango briefs. My tango briefs. What are they? My skimpies. <laughs> what budgie smugglers? <laughs> my tango briefs. Make sure my buttocks get tanned. I'd love to see AI translate that. <laughs> what would that come out? <laughs> It wouldn't come out as very nice, but it would be, that would be it. Anyway, that's what it's all about.
Your choice, it's up to you. <laughs> Do I, if I was you, I would enter it. That's all I'm going <laughs> right, to say. Uh, we're going to go through the front pages very, very shortly, <laughs> see what's making the news. We've got Claire Muldoon, we've got Alex Armstrong, and they're with us uh, next. So please join us. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, let's have a look at the front pages of the newspapers on this Tuesday morning. Daily Mirror, first of all. Uh, right, Rachel Reeves, Shadow Chancellor, she is promising to crack down on tax dodgers. Oh, they all do that, yeah. <laughs> they, sort of, yeah. I mean, they keep saying, we've got too much tax. We're taxed to the hilt. We're going to tax you more. Yeah, Here we're we going to go. get every yeah. last penny back. It does come round on the electoral cycle, doesn't it, that one? Here's the eye. Uh, that leading with this uh, meeting between David Cameron and uh, Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago in an attempt to unlock Congress, who are blocking uh, funding for Ukraine. Um, will that be successful? We'll have more on that in a moment. Mail, record surge of town hall staff pocketing more than £150,000 a year. Oh, that always sounds as if nobody's worth £150,000 a year. And there, it's a big salary, isn't it? Mm. What would you be doing at the council to get pounds Well, if your grand? council's going down the pan, yeah. you've got to answer for that. Um, here's the Times. They're focusing on Labour's proposals to enforce an inheritance tax raid on wealthy non-doms to pay for NHS and education commitments. The Express... Uh, campaigns pressing for urgent extra funds to end trauma faced by cancer patients. NHS must end long, cruel journeys for cancer care. We've got Claire Muldoon, we've got Alex Armstrong uh, here this morning because we couldn't get anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not true. <laughs> Claire, what's it to you? What's, what's, got, what's getting well, you talking today? Do you know what? It seems as if it's a slow news day, but it's actually not. There's quite a lot happening in the world. We've got um, Cameron visiting Trump. We've got Rachel Reeves on the manifesto, but all of these manifestos... They'd be lucky if anything is actually manifested. <laughs> yes, of course. Just, of yeah, course. Do you know what I mean? They can say what they want. Can't let, let me ask you about Cameron. Why is Cameron going to see Trump? Two things. Cameron's not going to be in power. Trump is going to be in mm -hmm. power. That, that is for sure. Mm. Well, clearly he thinks so, doesn't and he? And he also Cameron. thinks that Biden's not going to be in power, else he would have visited Biden, wouldn't well, he? Exactly. I mean, what are the optics of this whole visit? Yeah. If nothing less than to say it's a foregone conclusion that Trump might get in, will get in, and then Lord Cameron. 
the worst ever foreign minister, I think, in our time. Why, really? Oh, yeah, gosh, I, agree. I really don't do you, like why, him. Why do I do you? Oh, I mean, the, just this, look at his foreign policy while he was actually prime minister. I mean, you know, ch cozying up to China, selling swathes of London off. Now, he's obviously, China's the big enemy. That was just a few weeks ago. This is a guy that oversaw all of those problems, and now he's the man supposedly to fix it. Um, I, I just... It's, I, it's I don't, easy, though, with yeah. a crystal ball, I suppose, of course, isn't it, to, I do to get castigate. That. Um, I, I do think get what's that. perhaps more interesting is is the sort of unlikely union. Look, they're both right wing, aren't yeah. they, Trump and, and Cameron? But you've got on Cameron, who, who wrote in his memoirs on the record that this man was a misogynist, yes. that he was xenophobic, that yeah. he was divisive. How do you think that went down when they were sipping cocktails in Florida? <laughs> I'm sure uh, if Trump's read those memoirs, he, he's I, quite famously thin sure skinned, isn't he? Trump couldn't give two hoots yep. what David Cameron thinks. I'm surprised he's even met him. So am I. Do, do you know what I think he'd say? Don't cry, David, don't cry. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Don't, don't cry. Yeah. Mm. I don't even think Trump would understand what misogyny was. Mm. You, you could, I don't think, even think you could make it up. Mm. You know, and, but the, the other thing is, why is Cameron wanting um, uh, Trump to fund his part of NATO to fund the war in Ukraine? I think it's an absolute sham. I really, really do. Meaning, meaning what? But well, I think, well I, what I think is that the war in Ukraine against Russia is something a bit more political, a bit more nuanced than, you know, an actual all-out war. I think there's money being held. I think there's, it's a, it's a money-making machine and I think it's being laundered. I don't think it's a, a, a right and just war. A money-making machine for, for the arms companies? Or, well, as or... well. Or for people trading in oil or wheat? Yes, or... yes, there's something funny going on. There really, really is. Being... You can say that about any war, but, I mean, I think the West would... I mean, certainly most of people are agreed, whether it's Trump now, who admits that his position previously on NATO was a bit controversial, um, that you have to stand up against the aggression of Russia and defend Ukraine, because uh, if you don't, which country will be next? This is Europe. This is on European is, soil. Is, is Trump not saying, well, how does this end? Because I, I don't know, I don't think anyone knows where this war's going to end, because it's a war of attrition now, isn't it, really? You've got the Ukrainians sort of literally in trenches, you've got the Russians saying, we're just going to keep on putting people on the front lines, and the but Russians But this is what Putin is banking on. He's banking Quite on possibly. everybody to get tired yeah. of it, to mm. not want to fund um, mm. the war machine anymore. And but then but he, he has got a point, into, Isabel, into, with yeah. that. He has got a point about that, especially with the um, financial crisis the West is facing, by and large. I mean, all of us, we look at our, all our own lives. Yeah. I mean, you can listen to Labour talking about they're going to tax us more mm. and whatever, whatever. But people ha have never had it harder. I really do. Yeah. Well, yeah, but really, it'd be a lot really worse under Putin. There. You should speak to how hard it is under, under Putin in, in Russia. Yeah, that's the alternative. Um, can we talk, Claire, about... Well, we've sort of touched on tax dodgers. Do we want to to dwell on that? I mean, well, it's a big Labour story this morning. It's in front of a lot of the papers. But again, it's down to manifestos. I mean, it's just incredible, all this rhetoric coming out from both mm. sides now. Well, we have to fix what the 16 years of Conservative government have done, and we will fix it by £555 billion investment in HMRC. <laughs> and what are HMRC saying? Whoa, great, wonderful. It's just not on. Where are they going to get this money from? And, you know, she's got the... It's it sounds almost as if it's Tony well, Blair again. But, but she, she's banking on HMRC paying for themselves. So they're basically saying, we'll invest five billion in you or whatever it is, and I get us 500 billion back. Yeah. Well, there is a deficit there, a £32 billion deficit between what they expect to get in and they're not getting in. Well, I don't, I don't understand that because we, we've, we've just had a, an, another surplus in the government recently and they're saying they need to find more. Mm. I, I just don't know how much more you can squeeze out of people in this country. I think we need to invest in growth, grow the economy. That's, that's the way people spend more money. Don't, don't tax us to Reduce death. tax. Reduce, Reduce it tax. Needs to come down. Let, money, let to people come down. use their money and let people run the economy you by buying. You, you, you can't grow services. a country with, through taxes. Yeah, and, and clawing you know? back money that is owed is... is famously difficult, isn't it? it I mean, it often really ends is. up in expensive litigation. And the mm. Tories say they've already implemented 200 measures to try and tackle this. They don't think it's that simple. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Reeves might be sort of 
But it's talk, as Claire says, it's talk and talk yeah. is cheap. Talk is the cheapest thing mm. with all of this. I mean, when you look at um, who you need to go or the big companies who they don't touch, the Amazons yeah, exactly. and the, you know, yeah. all these companies that are that are not paying tax Starbucks, in this country. They're, they're creating them, yeah. employment mm. and then they, they hire the little people and then the little people are taxed. So that gives the government extra money there. But the big guys that are creating employment aren't taxed on Spot this. On. And and it's it's yeah. it's laughable. When and you the look other at, problem is... You, look, people who earn cash, right? People People who take cash, yeah. um, I can tell you, it's just they're not declaring that. They're not declaring it. And that's why they want to go from a cash society yep. to, to a cash. paperless society so they know what everybody's up to and what they're doing. But even if you were to take money from, you know, somebody who's earning 50,000 quid a year and they're making an extra thousand quid yeah. through fiddling uh, cash or whatever it is, that's not paying the bills. No, no, it's, no, not, it's know, not. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, not. St it's still after these big companies that we've got to go And for. the other issue I have with these big companies is the fact that they're using people almost like human slaves. It's these zero-hour contracts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are appalling. Mm -hmm. You cannot hold a family together on a zero-hour contract. Yeah, yeah. You cannot move up the, the ladder, property ladder, on a zero-hour contract. They are useless. You can't useless. get a mortgage, you can't They're get so a loan, wrong. you exactly. can't think of the future. Exactly. But, Claire, mm -hmm. you look to the front of the Express and here we are talking about more taxes and clawing back taxes that are unpaid. And then you see the services that are in desperate need of funding. Uh, and this in relation specifically to cancer patients. Um, what, what's their line? So this is, a, this is a, a report and a campaign from the Daily Express now that they want to increase the funding for more radiotherapy treatment centres. Uh, you're supposed to have a 45-minute journey uh, to your place that you need to get your oncology treatment. Yeah. And what, this, what the Express have found is that that's not the case in parts of Britain. That's absolutely diabolical. When people are being tested and they're being observed and they're finding out that they have got cancer, they need to be treated. Mm. I would say that the, the forward planning of the NHS has been so chronically bad, so chronically mismanaged, so chronically misfunded as well mm. in terms of the way they manage it. But, Claire, what? You then, if you were in charge of the health service, yeah. whatever it is, and, and people can come on, they'll always find ways of spending money. But the thing is, Alex, you've got to say which thing is worth spending money on. Yeah. And you can argue that um, toothache is, is worth spending money on, cancer treatment is worth spending money on, whatever. How do you actually say to somebody, no, we're not in the business yeah. of doing ingrown toenails or whatever, because that is what has to happen mm -hmm. eventually. You've got yeah. to say, yeah. Alex, your ingrown toenail is your problem. You have to pay for that yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not for the government to pay for. Yeah, and, and the thing is, it's really politically unpopular to say that, Eamon. Yeah. You know, no yeah. politician's yeah. going to come out and say, we're not going to win, we're not going to deal with that. And, and that's really part of the problem. We do need, as a country, to have a conversation about what we want out of our health service, because we keep chucking more and more cash into it every year, and, it, and the NHS has gone up in budget but it's never enough and why what uh, the question i want to know is why is it never enough what because is it that's so i'll tell broken? you alex i'll tell no. you why it's never enough because the nhs now operate like a menu when you walk into a restaurant yeah, yeah. What would you like to yes, have done yeah. to you today? Yeah. Do you like bigger breasts? Yes, exactly. Like well, also, ageing population. We have more and more people with complex needs. Yes, We've talked about obesity that's, that's, as well. That's legitimate. I would yeah. argue that when people with their mental health say, oh, my mental health's awful because I think my breasts are too small and it affects my self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it may well do. I'm not saying it doesn't. Mm. But I'm saying, well, if that is the case, that's for you to sort out yes. yourself that's and true. you pay without that's with your That's not for your the savings. NHS. The NHS yeah. are there, is there, was set up by Niamh Bevan to help people out of poverty, misery and get their health mm. back. Mm. Basic health needs. I'm sorry, but the NHS is nothing basic about it now. It's very bloated, isn't it? We also have to be honest and say that, you know, that we, we are experiencing the highest immigration on record and that's going to continue. 97% of our population growth will be immigrants over the next 10 years. And that's going to, we're going to need to build five cities the equivalent of Birmingham mm. to sustain that and all those services, doctors and nurses, mm. to support those people. Well, a lot of those immigrants are the doctors and nurses well, well, that are true, propping up true. the NHS. Now, I'd just yeah. like to make an announcement here. We mm. are now being inundated with people who get in touch today and said, thank you, Eamon, thank goodness you are here. <laughs> and telling people... I have seen those ones. Telling people how <laughs> Sorry, to get in touch, see. what gbnews.com forward slash your say is. So that's how you send us your views and your comments on, on that sort of thing. And um, this is our new website where we um, tie you up to this. Oh, look, this one from Ricky John Kirkman. I'm not interested in the cruise, so if I win, Eamon can have first offer. 
Thanks very much. There you that's, go. That's very good. Thanks a bunch. That's very good. <laughs> I was yeah. at home on my Todd. Well, no, because Claire, Claire Muldoon's going with me. There you go. There you go. We, we have both got our tangos ready to go. Oh, yeah, do you like the, 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 yes. Yes. They'll be broadcasting live in their tangos. We're doing this. i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a I'll tell you what we won't oh. have. Thick yogurt. Oh, gosh, oh, that's about yogurt bad. gate. Did you know, I'm facing that challenge today. I'd like some yogurt. If someone's going to come back with hideous stuff that looks like butter, oh, Greek. Can't well, it's very it. true. I just get this. I, can't, I don't know how you do this every week. It's that bad. It is either. that bad. I just want ordinary. You just want your normal thin Greg's. yogurt. That's what yeah. I want. Yeah. Like, yeah. Don't buy them in protein. Well, yogurt. these guys are coming back, and we're going to be discussing, amongst other things, why uh, the simple thing that work. Working in an office, mm -hmm. going to work, not working from home. No, nope, no. Nope, working nope. in an office is good for your mental health. Mm -hmm. That's why we are here. Mm -hmm. See you after this. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M6 in Cheshire is closed northbound from Junction 21 near Warrington to 21A for the M62 after an accident. In Cambridgeshire, the A47 is closed in both directions between the I Green roundabout and Thorny Road at I for an investigation. In Powys, the A4067 is closed because of a landslip between Cray and Astrid Gunless. In Devon, the A377 is closed at Chumley because of a landslip. Hover travel savings between Ride and South South Sea are suspended because of poor weather conditions and there's widespread disruption to train services across parts of England again today because of industrial action. There's no service on a number of routes and there's a reduced service on a number of other routes this morning. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Messages coming in about your budgie smugglers, <laughs> just to let you know. No, so I don't, don't know why you keep going on about my budgie. It's only about budgie. <laughs> with my bottom. Oh, tweet, oh tweet. right. It's not a budgie, all right? It's bigger than that. Ah, <laughs> an ostrich. It's an ostrich. Um, I just hope your budgie can't speak. <laughs> so what's the issue? All the presenters should wear the same as Eamon's budgie smugglers and present the programme. <laughs> I'm, I'm objecting to that. No, I'm not wearing budgie smugglers. Without. How do you know? So Claire's going to Australia, so she could definitely oh. indulge in some. They wear thongs down there, thongs. don't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, while, while you, we've been away here during the break, uh, we've been reciting the alphabet, mm. and um, there's a very... Uh, the guy who presents University Challenge is called Amol Rajan, and uh, basically, uh, he's in trouble there, Isabel. Why is he in trouble? Well, because University, University Challenge wants to see all these very learned people coming together and testing <laughs> how clever <laughs> they are. <laughs> and they really, <laughs> really object to the way he says the letter. I don't know how to say it without giving away how well, I here's, say here's it. Here's how we do. Here's how we do. We're all each going to recite the alphabet okay. past um, the letter. So, Claire, go, go and then stop at the letter that we're talking about. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A... 
Say it again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can say it. Oh, H. OK. <laughs> Alex? H. Oh, hold A, B, on. C, D, E, F, G, H. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Oh! Ooh. So you and Amol are on the same page with this. And this what are you? This has caused outcry. Why do you never tell anybody what you do? I just said I'm an <laughs> H. Oh, sorry. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Right. Um, so, anyway, he's caused an upset, apparently, and he's been so inundated with complaints about the way like he pronounces me. it. He's like me. He says H, Isabel, and everybody else says H. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is a thing, this is very interesting. I, I don't know what uh -huh. was right or wrong or whatever, but that's just the way mm. we were taught it at school. But in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, when I was a teenager, Alex, right, you would be coming home from school and um, you would be stopped and you'd be asked to recite the alphabet. And this would be by rival religious gangs. And basically, if you said H, the way Isabel says it there, by and large, you would be taught by an English institution or whatever, so you would be more likely to be Protestant. And if you said H, that was a reflection on the Gaelic, the way you'd have been taught in a Catholic school. I love this. And then you would have had the... Well, you love it. You wouldn't love it when you get your head kicked <laughs> Sorry, I'm in. misunderstanding it, because yeah. my husband says H, and his mother but he's is Catholic. Irish. Well, I'm also Catholic, but I haven't got that Yeah, but tradition. then you're English yeah. influence, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. So, so I find we, that we wouldn't have been English influence, so yeah. you just got beaten up. Um, so you had to be careful whether you lied and said H, even though you were a H person. Oh, my goodness. Fraught or, with or trouble. By, for, fraught with yeah. trouble. So, anyway... Did you ever get beaten up for getting it wrong? No. I also was able to run very, very quickly. <laughs> the, the other thing you were asked to do was to recite the Hail Mary. And the thing is, do you recite the Hail Mary? Or do you pretend then, you don't know it? Which then proves you're yeah. Catholic. Yeah. Or if you don't recite it, you're bluffing that you're a Protestant. So, believe me... My life, oh, screwed up. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. So, so where, where is Mr. Here. Rajan at? Where is he at? Well, he says through? everybody he knows and his whole family says H, um, but he's now going to change his ways, which I actually think is sadder. Yeah. I think he should just stick to his guns. If that's yeah. what he's always said, say H, mate. Um, but apparently it's upset so many people, um, he said. Um, <laughs> although he, he made this, I quite like this um, quote. He quotes George Bernard Shaw's observation, it's impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth mm. without making some other Englishmen hate or despise him. Do you think, do you think that was the basis of the Scottish hate law then? <laughs> do you think oh, that's 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 Yusuf has actually Claire. kind of like, you know, maybe he's read something for a change? Claire, I was in Glasgow at the weekend, yeah. right? And everybody was talking about the old firm yeah. game, right? And they were all talking about this whole, oh, we're going to make complaints and we're going to do this, we're going to yeah. do that. People were laughing yes. at this, this, yes. whole yeah. bill, this, this yes. so called hate bill. Yeah. Everywhere. They were making a, a, an issue about it. There's reports today that the police are just completely overwhelmed. Um, yeah. Yeah, inundated. Yeah. There's been jokes. I mean, I saw the, the, the funniest joke I saw online about this, and I'm sorry if anyone's offended by it, but there was a someone filmed a, a lot of police swarming at this place in Glasgow, yes. and, and the comment was, "I think there's been a mass misgendering." And that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the kind of silliness that people think yeah. this law is, and it, it is. it's a joke, isn't it? Now, here's something that I find. Um, I just think it's awful. I think. By and large, with food, we're being poisoned yep. and no mm. one does anything about it. And I don't care if the poison is sugar or, or toxins. Mm. This is front of the Metro newspaper um, today. And basically what it says is here is forever toxins. These are toxins that just don't go away um, in our fruit and veg. So these are spread over all of these things and they stay there mm. a lifetime. Yeah, you can't wash them off. Yeah, strawberries are the worst. And then once you uh, eat them, presumably these forever chemicals are in your body. Yeah. And we yeah. wonder the why chain. there's this huge all rise in Food chain. That's it. There is statistics and there's evidence to completely back up what you have just said, Isabel, mm -hmm. that all these G uh, GM crops, all these crops that have been sprayed on the polytunnels, etc., yeah. etc., et when we eat them, when we digest them, mm -hmm. these things, keep, the toxins keep in your body. It's in and the And then, food Claire, chain. when you drink from a bottle of water to wash it down and the water's from a plastic bottle... Yep. Uh, the plastic stain mm. within your system. Yeah. And my point, Alex, is they know these things. Mm. Why don't they ban them? Why don't they ban the use of plastic, single-use, throwaway plastic? Why, why are we drinking from a plastic bottle? Why are we not drinking from a glass bottle? It's really interesting. I was, I was actually talking to someone about this the other day, and I, I think I know what the answer is. It's, it's, it's our clout as a country to say... If we said to Evian, you're not, no, longer, no more plastic bottles, 
What are everyone going to do? They're going to say, oh, we're going to change our whole supply chain for so little oil. Glass. Always said glass. Well, yeah. That's true, but you pay a premium for that. They, mm. They'll say, oh, we can't keep bottles of water cheap <laughs> enough mm. because plastic is the only thing we can use. I always think it's interesting that we all haven't actually just taken the view, you know what, if we've got any little corner of garden, whether it's a windowsill to grow tomatoes, yep. whether it's a postage stamp to put a few bits and bobs in your garden. I've just started a kitchen garden, so I'm really excited about this. Nothing has been, has grown yet, but I've just put in carrots, I've got rhubarb, I've got um, raspberries yes, growing. Yes, you get that on a one-off basis. Onions. You're not going to have carrots every Tuesday. No, but I'm going to get so many, I'm going to freeze them yes, all. Yes, but you're not going to solve the problem. Well, and it's I'm like, not going to be you, consuming like any of these later as well. in the year. You, so you why go, don't we all You go try. to a petrol station and you're, you're thirsty and you say, right, I need a bottle of water. You'll not get one in yeah. glass, I'll tell you that. You know, the so, thing, sorry, just, just to talk about the pesticide thing, because you know they, they spray this stuff, one, to get rid of the insects, but, but then two, to keep them lasting longer, the, fr the food yes. fresher. And that's a part, again, we have to go back to this farm Debate. I think we were all talking about this a few weeks ago. We're, we're not, we're not look, investing enough on our farmers to produce fresh food every exactly, day. That's exactly what so we're they, talking about. So they're having about. to spray it and put mm. rubbish in and it And also to keep it that then is going into our rivers yeah. and it's also degrading the soil, which is so short-termist yeah, and it's just a yeah. disaster. And why aren't we eating seasonally? Yes, Why true. do we demand, you know, that we can have grapes and strawberries in winter mm. and, you know, everything else when it shouldn't be? Mm. Freezers are the way forward when it comes to fruit and veg. I'm a complete convert. You can, yes. eat, you can eat fruit and veg of all different seasons all year round as long as you stick them in the freezer yep. almost as soon as you've yep. got them. Um, anyway. Guys, um, I want to talk about this, the uh, Mel Stride. Uh, Mel Stride, right, so he's... We had him uh, on yesterday. Had we? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's because I was late yesterday. Oh, yes. you missed him. Right. Missed what, was he, what was he saying? Yeah. Well, but what he's basically said is work. He said, work is good for your mental health. Getting up in the morning, having a sense of purpose, interacting with other people in the workplace, yeah. having that conversation by a water cooler or whatever, no. may mm. be good for your mental health. Mm. Mm. And his mission is to get as many people into work and into a workplace as possible. Do you know what's not going to help that? Well, well, the new legislation, the employment legislation that just came into effect mm. yesterday, that any new person going for a new job can actually request to work from home. Permanently. Mm. Mm. Well, you know... I, it's just appalling. Could, Absolutely I, appalling. Well, you know what's not good for mental health is being squeezed into a train that you've paid a fortune for a ticket for and you can't even get a seat um, and commuting huge yeah. distances. Yeah. Um, you know, there is an argument in the modern world when you've got technology to not always have to be in the office. But I don't understand you, the need Monday yeah, to Friday. But it Run more be, trains. It, it, it shouldn't be a requirement no. to hire someone. They get to tell you that they're exactly. working from home. Mm. So if you yeah. need somebody... Um, well, we couldn't do our job from home. There are clearly jobs you just can't yeah. do from home. Yes. You can't nurse and there's, from home. Yeah, that's that you true. shouldn't that's do true. from home. And, you know, Isabel and I have this, this argument about this, but I, there's no doubt, and I only go by my own experience, that if I was working from home, work would not have my full attention. Yes. It would have some of my attention, but then I'd be saying, oh, look, there's that needs done, or this needs done, or I've got to watch this on the yeah. TV, or the dog needs to be brought a walk, or whatever it yep. happens to be. So you're, you're not devoting yourself totally, and no-one's going to convince me of it in any other I way. I agree wholeheartedly with you. And the other lovely thing about being in the office, about talking to people, is you learn from people. Mm. You might have someone that's been in the job longer. Learn from them. Either learn not how to do it, or learn how to do it. And then you can mentor, you can help serve, you can actually just... Help and what about add relationships. Yes. I mean, how many yeah, people yeah. have met their partner in the workplace? Mm. What do you do if you're a youngster leaving university and you basically don't see another human? I mean, I think of my sister-in-law, uh, ten years younger than us, and she, since COVID, has worked from home. She lives alone. Mm. You know, it's really hard to meet people it's, in that situation. You know, we have this debate in my business all the time because we do four days a week in the office, which is actually quite a lot by modern standards. Yeah, funnily yeah, enough, yeah. four days is quite a lot. And there's a ton of people, and I and I see this online with the younger generation on. Mass and they they hate office culture. They absolutely despise it. And part of, part of me understands Which why. Which part of office well, culture? The, the the white walls, the sitting in front of a screen all day, the the, the sort of trashy well, services. You know what I hear? I hear open offices. I yes. hear you can't go into an office and talk to somebody <clears throat> privately yes. or close the door and mm. have a conversation to encourage yep. or discipline someone or whatever. That's right. But uh, your views, let us know. We've got your that say. gbnews.com forward slash your say, get in touch, and um, uh, Claire and Alex are going to be back in 45 minutes' time. Enjoyed that, guys. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much um, indeed. And we'll Lovely. say good morning to Annie Shuttleworth. There's a lot of blue coming your way on the forecast.
a brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with wrist band of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. It should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. latest GB News travel. Good morning. The M6 in Cheshire is closed northbound from Junction 21 at Warrington to 21A for the M62 after an accident causing long delays. On the M6 in the West Midlands, two lanes are closed southbound for emergency repairs between Junction 7 and 6 towards Spaghetti Junction, Birmingham causing delays. In Cambridgeshire, the A47 is closed each way off the I Green roundabout near Peterborough for an investigation after an accident last night. In Devon, the A377 is closed at Chumley because of a landslip. In Dorset, the A35 is blocked westbound by a fallen tree between Charmouth and Axminster. Harbour travel sailings turned from the Isle of Wight are suspended between South Sea and Ryde because of poor weather conditions. And there's a reduced rail service on a number of rail routes in England today because of ongoing industrial action. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. A very good morning to you. It is fast approaching 7 o'clock. You're tuned in on Tuesday, the 9th of April. Uh, very nice to have you on board. Uh, you're on board with breakfast here on GB News. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Here's the news this morning. New developments in the manhunt for Habiba Masoom, suspected of stabbing a woman to death in Bradford on Saturday. Mark White has the latest. Well, it is a shocking development as court documents reveal that the prime suspect in this fatal stabbing was on bail, previously charged with assaulting and threatening to kill Kulsuma Akhtar, who was stabbed to death on Saturday afternoon. Millions of people across North America have turned their eyes to the sky to catch a glimpse of the solar eclipse overnight. 
Labour have pledged to crack down on tax dodgers in a bid to fund their pledges for the NHS. And we'll be speaking to the Shadow Financial Secretary, James Murray, in just a moment. How clean is our fruit and vegetables? We will be speaking to self-proclaimed king of vegetables about the concerning rise of pesticides in our food. And this morning, we'll be asking whether the Foreign Office is too elitist. This is as former diplomats call for radical reform to the department. That's our debate later. Uh, front page of the, the Mirror today talks about the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. Um, she's set to announce a new crackdown on what she terms are tax dodgers in a bid to help fund the NHS. So that's all the, the good bit. Who are these tax dodgers and um, and where are we going to get this money from? Let's go to James Murray. Um, James uh, is the, the Shadow Financial Secretary. Um, J James, how much of this money is floating about and who are these tax dodgers? Yeah, well, we know that there's uh, up to £6 billion uh, which could be got from a greater focus uh, on uh, compliance uh, and efforts on tax avoidance. That's what the head of the National Audit Office said uh, earlier this year. Uh, and so we're setting up our plans today to crack down on that tax avoidance and to get that money um, into the public purse. Because, you know, when people right across Britain are paying more and more tax, uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. Um, and so that's why we're setting out our plans. To... I want to know, do they owe £100, £1,000 or £100 million? I'm just sort of trying to get who, who these villains are. Mm, yeah, well, one part of our, our plan is to uh, remove the loopholes which the government has left open for non-DOMs uh, in their plans to uh, follow our lead and close uh, the non-DOM tax loophole uh, this year. So, as you may remember, we've been setting out for a number of years about ending a non-DOM tax status. The government said they wanted to follow our lead after years of saying they wouldn't. Uh, but they're leaving open loopholes in that, which means that people can avoid paying hundreds of millions of pounds of tax. So we want to close those loopholes. But that's part of a broader approach to investment in HMRC uh, to improve compliance. Um, and, you know, one of the areas where it's important to focus, for instance, is on some of the larger uh, businesses where... They will have tax affairs which are more complicated, uh, where the sums of money we're talking about are greater. Uh, and so that's a really important place to focus efforts uh, to make sure people and businesses are paying the tax that they owe. It was so easy to claw back this money. Why didn't you announce it before? Isn't it simply that over the last four weeks, you uh, and effectively your boss, Rachel Reeves, and the team in the Treasury have been desperately trying to plug a black hole that's been blown into your sums by the Chancellor when he decided to use your non-DOM tax policy? Well, we've long set out uh, our ambitions to take on the ta tax gap and to make sure that they owe. Uh, we set out for a number of years about how we wanted to close the non-DOM tax loophole. You're right to say that after years of opposing us, the government U-turned and followed our lead. Uh, but the government has still left holes um, in their plans. They've still left loopholes, which means that non-DOMs uh, will get away without paying hundreds of millions of pounds uh, of tax that they should be paying. So we set out how we would close those loopholes as part of our wider efforts uh, to improve compliance and crack down on tax avoidance, uh, because that's money that we're owed as the taxpayer and yeah. should go into the NHS and breakfast clubs as we, as we set mm. out. Well, James, we, we were talking about this earlier in, in the programme today, and I think everybody's in favour of the idea that if you are particularly a, a massive company, a big company, whether you're Apple, whether you're Amazon, or, uh, you know, I don't know who to name on this, but the idea seems to be that they can come here, they can set up business, they can give lots of jobs to people on small salaries, but they themselves avoid paying the big bills. Now, the argument against you on this will be, if you make life difficult for these big employers, they'll simply go elsewhere and we'll lose out on the jobs. Well, there has been a piece of work um, over the last few years about some of those large uh, multinationals uh, making sure that they pay uh, their fair share of tax. And we've been pushing the government uh, to take action on that as part of an uh, international deal to make sure that we end that race to the bottom, because otherwise uh, what some large multinationals do is shift their profits around to areas where there are uh, lower effective uh, tax rates and avoid paying their fair share. But this is, a, this is a broader piece we're talking about here. So this is about making sure that right across the board, 
uh, people pay uh, the tax that they owe. And, you know, we know the vast majority of people in Britain are not just paying taxes, but paying more and more taxes. You know, the tax burden is set to be its highest in 70 years. And so particularly in that context, um, it's not fair uh, that a minority are not paying what they owe. Um, and that's why we believe this is an important time to focus efforts on closing that tax gap and make sure everyone pays their fair share. How would Angela Rayner fare under this tighter scrutiny of tax affairs? Well, Angela Rayner has been under scrutiny in the media recently. Uh, she's answered all the questions. You has know, I'm she? confident she's done uh, nothing wrong. Why but won't you, you think, publish well, her she's legal all advice? The questions and, well, that's a personal matter for, for Angela. You know, what, what we're saying um, is that if you look at what the Conservatives are doing in office, uh, they are uh, making sure there are loopholes there for non-DOMs to continue avoiding paying hundreds of million pounds of tax. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, they are, they are happy to talk about someone in the Labour Party to try and distract attention away from their record in government. But what I want to talk about, what I'm interested uh, in making sure we're setting out is our plans to close those loopholes worth hundreds of millions, billions of pounds over the next parliament to fund our public services. But you must see that it's ironic that here you are talking about trying to clamp down on tax loopholes and tax avoidance. And there are questions in the public domain, not least that have been published by the Mail on Sunday and other papers in recent weeks, her own photograph seeming to contradict her own version of events. Uh, we've got the Tory party chair saying out uh, this morning, that, uh, Richard Holden, that this is highly corrosive to the reputation of your leader, Sir Keir Starmer. Now, what, what I think is, what is absolutely hypocritical and awful, um, James, is a lot of these accusations are coming from people who are non-DOM, um, who are outside and who may be in a position where they're dodging hundreds of millions of pounds that could be taxed. And, you know, what, what is the worst case scenario with Angela Rayner? She owes a thousand quid or something. You know, I don't. Yeah, but the I, point is, she could be our future Deputy Prime Minister. And if she doesn't have to pay the taxes that she's owed, why should any of us? This is a legitimate question of somebody who's very likely to be in a very significant position of power in this country. Well, there have been plenty of questions put to Angela in recent weeks, and she's answered them. Um, I'm confident she's done nothing wrong. But, you know, as Eamon said, there are hundreds of millions of pounds, billions of pounds over the next few years, which non-DOMs are going to avoid paying because the government are, you know, in, in broad daylight, leaving open these loopholes uh, so they can avoid paying their fair share. You know, we've been talking about the unfairness um, of non-DOMs not paying their fair share of tax for years and years. The government have been opposing us, you know, tooth and nail. Finally, they U-turn, but they leave a gaping loophole uh, which means that hundreds of millions, billions of pounds over the next few years uh, will still be avoided because of the loopholes the government are leaving open for those non-DOMs. OK, James, we're going to leave it there. We'll hear from the, the Shadow Chancellor, uh, Rachel Reeves, um, today uh, on what, what she's got planned. But thanks for highlighting things. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, court documents have revealed that the murder suspect in the fatal stabbing of a woman in Bradford was out on bail after making threats to assault and kill her. This is a terribly disturbing story. Uh, what we know at the moment is uh, Habir Masum is 25 years of age. Uh, he's from Bangladesh. He's a Bangladeshi national. He came to Britain on a student visa. Let's go to our Home and Security Editor, Mark White, and Mark will fill you in more with uh, what we know. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Well, this case certainly has taken a serious and worrying turn. Perhaps not a surprise, though, given that West Yorkshire Police and Greater Manchester Police said yesterday afternoon that they'd referred themselves to the policing watchdog, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, because of previous contact they'd had with both the victim, Kulsuma actor, and the prime suspect, Habibur Masum. Um, that contact we now know was in the form uh, of allegations and a subsequent charge of Habibur Masum, who appeared in court at Manchester Magistrates Court on the 27th of November last year to face charges that he assaulted Kulsuma Akhtar and also that he threatened to kill her. Now, he denied those charges. He was granted conditional bail despite prosecution objections. And one of the conditions was that he did not go anywhere near uh, Kulsuma Akhtar. Well, in the course, we now know that she was stabbed to death 
on Saturday afternoon in Bradford city centre and that Masoom is the prime suspect. Police have described him as extremely dangerous. They've warned the public not to go anywhere near him, but if they have any information on his whereabouts, to dial 999. And yesterday we revealed as well that Masoom came to the UK two years ago. He's a Bangladeshi national. He arrived here on a student visa. Now, what we're told is that he is not an overstayer, that he is still legitimately here on that student visa. However, the Home Office said that they would not go into his immigration status. They did say, however, that anyone who is a foreign national and who is ultimately convicted of a serious crime would be deported at the earliest possible opportunity. Leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, it's very interesting that people get uh, an idea of that man from his um, video blogs that, that he does and uh, the accusation that's levelled at him at uh, the moment. How do those both go together? Your views always mm -hmm. welcome. GBnews.com forward slash your say, the new way to get in touch with us. Yeah, uh, we're going stateside now. Uh, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has flown overnight and met up with Donald Trump at his Mar-a-Lago, Florida residence before he'll be holding talks with his counterpart, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, doing a joint press conference this afternoon. So what was discussed? It's believed Ukraine, um, NATO, the Middle East, all on the agenda. Mm. And this is the first summit between a senior government minister and the former president since he left office in 2021. Let's now get the views of former chief of staff to Nadim Zahawi, and that's James Price. Uh, James, we're sitting, we're just scratching our heads here a bit and just wondering, Cameron, how long would he be for and secretary for? How long would he be in government for? Um, it's assuming that uh, what use is Trump unless he becomes president, which looks highly likely that he would. Um, why is he seeing Cameron? Why is Cameron going to see him? It's a great question. I mean, I think we, uh, back in 2016, you've still got David Cameron as prime minister before the Brexit debate. You've got Trump as this insurgent outsider. No one gave a, a hope and hell of him becoming president. And he talked about how he would have, I think one of the most controversial things was a, a ban on people from Muslim countries entering the United States. That, by the way, would have affected my old boss, Nadim Zahawi, who's born uh, in Baghdad. And Cameron said that these things were stupid, it was wrong, all the rest of it. Safe in the knowledge that Trump would never be president, would never have to worry about these things. Fast forward all these years, Lord Cameron, as he now is, Foreign Secretary, having to go and talk to him. And this is just the nature of diplomacy. This is how these things work. You know, you, 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 uh, I think we find that in America, what, three, 250 years ago, they decided they didn't want this island to be controlling them. And so it was very foolish of us to be whine, uh, uh, pining on, on what's going on over there. I'm just looking forward to the idea that if Keir Starmer does ever actually make it as prime minister and Trump gets back into the White House, these two are going to have to cozy up with each other as well. Well, yeah, I heard Farage saying he'd be the go-between between, between Starmer <laughs> and, um, and Trump, which is an unlikely <laughs> set of people to put in a, in a little sandwich there. Um, but just going back to, to Cameron, um, if you've read his uh, memoir on the record, not only at the time did he call him uh, xenophobic and racist for those comments about Muslims, but I mean, he's called him a misogynist, he's called him divisive, he didn't hold back. Those memoirs are in black and white. Now, Trump might not be, you know, a man who sits down and reads a book, but presumably he'll been told by his advisers some of the views that Lord Cameron has. They're not exactly a marriage made in heaven. Do you think that will ma matter? And is it in Trump's interest to sit down down with Lord Cameron? Well, I, I suppose when, uh, when Theresa May had some of these things put to her when she was Prime Minister, she said, you know, maybe sometimes opposites attract. And then a few <laughs> minutes later, you see them holding hands going down a, a, uh, some steps yeah. together. Um, this is just the nature of international yeah. diplomacy. And I think the wonderful thing, in my other half is American, we have the special relationship. I think it's something that goes much, much deeper than just politics, mm. you know, military alliances, especially in terms of intelligence, in terms of economics. I think we should be cozying up with the Americans much, much more mm. because you know, they are, as, as Lincoln said, the last best hope for mankind. And in the world that's getting increased, increasingly dangerous, China with Russia, with Iran, all working together. We need to be standing shoulder to shoulder on these big issues. And that's what Cameron's gone to talk to uh, Trump about. Well, yeah, because he Ukraine. wants to try and sort out this block um, by Republican senators uh, in Congress um, of this big funding package, aid package for Ukraine. Um, that, I suppose, is why he's gone to an unelected official because of his representative 
um, links, Republican links, rather than it's a snub from Biden not to be meeting Lord Cameron. Is that how you would view it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this has been happening in reverse as well. When, when Americans come over here, they've been seeing the government and they've also been seeing uh, Sir Keir Starmer's team as well. I think that's just yeah. a, an important part of doing this. The way that American politics work is that you have to it's try and get things passed through both uh, houses of Congress. You, you throw all sorts of different bits in. So in, as well as giving uh, money for, for Ukraine, the Republicans want money to protect the southern border. We think we've got a problem with illegal immigration in the UK. Millions of people have swept up through that southern border since Joe Biden took office. So it's all this kind of horse trading that's such an ugly part of politics that turns most people off. Mm -hmm. um, but if we want to stand strongly with, with Ukraine against uh, the, the aggression of, of Putin, we need American money because you know, American uh, military spending is more than China and Russia and the UK and France and the next top 10 powers all put together mm. um, and that they, they can and should be a force for good in the world and if mm. Cameron can convince Trump of that then then all power to him. Mm -hmm. James thanks very much thank indeed. You. Good summarization thank you very much. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other stories coming in on this uh, Tuesday morning post office on rising public inquiry uh, resumes today. Campaigner Alan Bates set to make his first appearance as he calls for bonuses paid to bosses to be clawed back. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led to the post office wrongly prosecuting more than 900 sub postmasters. Up to £11 million from water company fines will be reinvested into schemes to improve waterways and wetlands, the government has claimed. The Water Restoration Fund, which has now opened for applications, will offer grants to local groups, charities, farmers and landowners to help them improve rivers, lakes, streams and wetlands where illegal pollution has occurred. Today marks three years since the death of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, of course, uh, he died aged 99 at Windsor Castle and was the longest serving royal consort in history. We've been asking you to send yeah. in any memories uh, of Prince Philip because it is a sad anniversary. Those three years feel like they've flown by, but also just what a turbulent time it's been um, for the royal family uh, since he, he left. Well, Head he, of the he, family, wasn't he? Well, I think he was seen as the enforcer. I basically mm. think uh, he would basically have a have a word with saying, you know, you're out of line there or don't mm. do this or this is what you'll do. Well, they always said that Her Majesty the Queen was the sovereign, you know, she held the crown, but he was the head of the family, mm. absolutely. Um, so... Yeah, have you ever met him? We'd love to hear your stories this morning. Um, any anecdotes or indeed just favourite moments? You know, what did you love about Prince Philip? And what do you miss about Prince Philip from public life? And wh who do you see as his most similar relation? Lots of people draw um, comparisons with the Princess Royal. Uh, and what a fantastic yeah. sort of um, daughter think, she I was to Andrew him. I think Andrew was quite like him. From what I know of them, I thought Andrew was quite like him as well. I, I think he, he has an influence. You look at Edward or whatever, and they, there is an influence. Physi there's a physical resemblance, I think, in Edward, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, but I think you're right, in attitude and sort of bluster, it's much more Prince Andrew. Bluster. But in terms of being hard-working and maybe sort of gutsy, that's the Prince's role. But, hey, what do I know? We'll be speaking to Ingrid Stewart a little bit later in the programme, who knows much more about royal matters than us, and she'll be reflecting on the anniversary. Uh, we were just commenting about uh, the weather there. You just don't know what to expect, but it's usually quite wet. Let's go to Annie Shuttleworth. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. Should stay largely dry on Wednesday across 
across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. But temperatures will be around average. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. So many messages coming in uh, today and yesterday about where's Paul Coit. We've axed him. He does. We decided he was the worst part of our programme. Oh, no, no. He was so leery. Nobody liked him. Really unpopular, so we got rid. Only joking. It's the exact opposite. We adore Paul Coit, and he's having a well-earned rest. It's Easter. The well, guy never stops working. No, he's, uh, his daughter is looking at university options, and they're going around the country looking at university options this week. But here is mm. the point, and here's mm. what I want you to get in touch and let us know today. All other stations I work for, have worked for breakfast stations over the years, sport does not rate. Right? Sport does not rate. People don't watch, particularly uh, the demographic housewives with children. And Paul Coit comes on and sport does rate on this programme. And we think, and we'd like to know from you, does it rate because it's sport or does it rate because it's basically not sport? Because we talk about anything. We, 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 we do a bit of sport, to be fair, yeah, but it we rates nod, because we it's nod sport. We have no sports footage, we have no sports yeah, pictures. But, I mean, it's not Coit, sport. he does his quizzes, he does his accents, he's yeah. loved by everyone. Um, the so basically, we want to know from you um, what is it about Paul Coit that you love, that you like, and um, and what is it? And is it, is it the sports news? As is about was saying, is it actually the specifics of the sports news you want, or is that incidental? Or is it his accents? I mean, he never gets to a sports bulletin, as we call them, but uh, there's not much of a bulletin, but uh, without an accent. He loves to ham it up. In fact, you, you thought he was Australian when he, I thought, when well, he first met. I, He's I, from Essex. As I, uh, when they were asking me to join this programme and I said, uh, I want the, uh, the Australian guy the <laughs> to do the sport. But he wasn't Australian, he's from Essex. Yeah. Anyway, but great We guy. love him, we great miss guy. him, but he'll be fan. back, have no fear. Um, and we, we, get, we get in touch. The thing about Paul and I, what we do is we um, send ourselves lots of um, programmes. Like, for instance, I sent him the opening titles yesterday of mm. the Rockford Files. Right. Do you know what the Rockford Files is? No. Has Jim Rockford here? I'm so whatever. sorry, he's not here to sing along with you. Uh, well, he, appre he appreciated it. You know, he appreciated. He saw this because it was, um, I think, it was uh, a birthday anniversary or something for for um, uh, Jim Rockford yesterday. Who, who, who played Jim Rockford? Who played Jim? Don't Rockford? ask me. No, no. Of course, <laughs> I, as I really worry, I should know this straight away. But do we uh, Google it? You keep talking. Yeah, I keep talking. But James Garner. There James you go. Garner, James Garner, yeah. Um, very handsome, very tall guy. Um, great show, great opening titles. So uh, Paul and I talk about that. Captain Scarlet, Thunderbirds, goodness knows what. Uh, lots of programmes from the 70s and the 80s. You know what I'm big into at the moment? Oh, yeah. And I'm following on Instagram. Yeah. Wonder Woman. Oh, right. Yeah, I think the, the, the latest Wonder Woman, Gil Gado, is... Wonderful, incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, but female the, icon, I'd say. Yeah. Feminist. But the the icon. original one in the uh, the seventies and and the eighties in the America. Pointy boobs. Yes, yes. Yes. You're right. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's she's quite good anyway. My producer, who's twelve, <laughs> um, has just basically <laughs> said, "Give away next. Give away next," which means he's bored because he's not interested in the seventies or the eighties. He wasn't even born. But anyway, uh, that's what Paul and I delve into. Here is the competition, the Great British Giveaway. Have a go. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 pounds plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
Right, and uh, just to let you know, still to come, former diplomats are calling for radical changes to the Foreign Office. As if that'll affect us. Anyway, we'll be debating whether the Foreign Office is too... Well, they say elitist. It's not elitist. It's talking about, is it, has it put its big foot on, on top of everybody in the world and does everybody hate the Foreign Office because of all of that? We're debating that. You see, it's another thing that why you should... You know, you know what it is? It's yeah, another, another one of, thing. It's another one of these arguments that says mm. why you shouldn't be proud to be British. Mm. Basically, that's yeah. what it is, yeah. right? Um, and if that's not me. That's only me telling you what the theory is. Uh, about this. They're putting the boot into the Foreign Office, rightly or wrongly, after this. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism? When you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it. Um, I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society and when you would uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between islam and islamism people like me you and me we are drawing that distinction we're trying to maintain that distinction but if you uh, look at the commentator from the muslim community some commentator they would like to blur this line and they would ask you what is islamism where does it exist sorry it does exist mm. we see it and the teacher this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Right, some of the UK's most senior diplomats have recommended reducing the number of colonial paintings in the Foreign Office to try and modernise it. OK, so a report by senior officials said the Foreign Office is somewhat elitist and rooted in the past. So, is it? Joining us now to discuss uh, all of this, anti-racism activist uh, Iman Aiton and royal historian and broadcaster Rafe Hadel Mancou. Uh, Rafe, do you see what they're getting at here? Do you see what, why why uh, the accusation is being levelled? Look, a bit of interior decorating isn't going to solve the Foreign Office's woes. Let's get that straight. You know, the, the, the mandarins who wrote this report into the problems of the Foreign Office don't seem to realise that they themselves are the problem. Because for the past quarter of a century, our institutions have been run by people who, who actually loathe Britain who are embarrassed by our history and any expression or pride or patriotism. We've had essentially a long march through the institutions and it's one that has completely captured all of our institutions 
And the people who are now in place are a new elite, but they are a progressive liberal elite, not the sort of elites we think about of old conservatives, chaps going to Eton and so forth. The new elites that occupy these buildings bear no resemblance to the generations who built them and, and ran them for years. They're actually cuckoos in the nest. And in the case of the Foreign Office, of course, the rot sets in much earlier. I mean, it's always been ashamed of Britain. You may remember there was a famous episode of the BBC comedy, uh, Yes, Prime Minister, in the 1980s, when the Prime Minister, Jim Hacker, says the White House believed that the Foreign Office is full of communists and traitors, to which his private secretary, Bernard Woolley, says, well, not entirely full, Prime Minister. And then you remember, you know, Simon MacDonald last year, the former permanent secretary, said that he and his colleagues were in tears and crying uh, when Britain voted for Brexit. And then, of course, after that, they were completely subservient and defeatist when it came to negotiations with okay. Brussels. And okay. now they're saying that Britain shouldn't project an image of greatness on the world stage. I mean, that says it all. They're embarrassed and ashamed of Britain. And we should actually be at the forefront in celebrating the fact that Britain invented the modern world. And the fact that okay. there are so many democracies around the world is precisely because of the British Empire. Iman, what would you see wrong with uh, Rafe's argument there? Um, well, I, I actually agree with the first point. So we're, we're, we're doing better, Rafe. We're starting to find ways that we can agree. Not always, but sometimes. Your first point about changing paintings, solving the problems of the Foreign Office, I agree it, it, it won't solve all the problems of the Foreign Office. But it will help with um, inclusivity. It will help with making sure that anyone that comes into that office isn't um, feeling kind of dehumanized because of paintings that remind them of subjugation and murder and rape of the past, right? So it's about that inclusivity. This is why it's, it's really important to change uh, paintings. Will it make a difference overall in terms of the issues that they need to deal with in helping our country? No, but it will help with inclusivity. Mm. That's an aside. In terms of you saying that uh, it's run by elitists, well, it is. Most organizations, most departments are. Elitism is centered around superiority in terms of the quality, or sorry, qualities and um, skills, right? So I think it's safe to say Eamon's here today because of his skills, right? He would technically, one could argue, he is superior in his field. So every department in life, every institution that we have in Britain is run by elitism. So I actually don't have a problem with that. The reason why I have an issue is because when we decide to be elitist, for those that aren't white, we connect those things because it's just the fact elitism is superiority, which connects to British superiority, which connects or is associated with the British Empire. And the British Empire, with its superiority, is connected to the subjugation, exploitation, rape, torture, and murder of many people around the world. So when we talk about elitism, we're kind of talking about two separate issues. We've got a superior set of people with skills and uh, qualities, which is a good thing in order to help us thrive. And then you've also got that elitism, which basically lacks diversity mm. in thought. And the reason why we need diversity in thought um, in regards to the Foreign Office is because they deal with so many different types of communities, so many different types of people, yeah. so many different Wouldn't types of thoughts, right? Wouldn't energy be better spent? No, and look, I, I don't disagree. Nobody should be dehumanised. Nobody should be feeling subjugated when they step into the Foreign Office. But wouldn't you prefer that the Foreign thing? Office... That's not what you're saying. No, 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 I am. I just wanted... Yeah. I'm so glad that you, you, you've um, validated my point. I just wanted to say, imagine walking into GB News right now and you saw, like, pictures on the wall of, like, women being, like, either beaten or... I don't or, have pictures uh, of beatings kind of, uh, in the Foreign Office. Yeah. And, and to be... No, no, to no, be no, honest, no, I mean, I'm, there's I'm, plenty I'm of minorities I can grow like. Sorry, but, can I just finish? I'm just giving you an example of what it would be like to walk into some type of office where you, your gender, your race, your age mm -hmm. is um, demeaned, belittled... Mm -hmm. Um, uh, used as a as a means to give pride to others, what you and your people have suffered. You well, probably all, all feel I was some going type to say of way. I hear that, that point, and, and I, I, I hear that defending. point. Nobody should be subjugated, but wouldn't it be better if the foreign office was spending that money, that energy, that focus on perhaps tackling modern slavery, the issues we've got in China, where there are Uyghurs being persecuted by the Chinese? That would be surely under the foreign office's jurisdiction. Ray Fadel Manku, don't you think there are better things to be spending their time and energy? On? Absolutely. And I don't think Imran has actually ever been to the Foreign Office because, I mean, the, the images that she's depicting are just I'm don't not. exist. I mean, the fact oh. is these are, these are these are wonderful works of art 
created by a Jewish Huguenot, a descendant of two uh, suppressed minorities who escaped to Britain for a better life as refugees. Uh, these celebrate actually the history yeah. of Britain, bringing uh, bringing itself in into the United States. May I please finish? My point? Thank you so much. And just like, uh, it, just it like celebrates um, it celebrates ahead. Britain actually, you know, bringing the bringing the many of the world's countries up to the level where they joined the League of Nations uh, after after the First World War. And so it's a celebration actually of Britain playing its part in improving the world, creating democracies around the world, and creating a system where actually we can have the sort of diplomacy rather than war okay. that we have at the moment time. And yep. what are we saying? Are we saying that ambassadors are too are too fragile to uh, walk past their painting? James Cleverly, you just said that. You said that. May I please finish my that, point? Right? You've had a long time to speak. I'm terribly sorry. Come on. So have you. Um, You've had more time than me, well, sir. You'll both have your say. Don't worry. We'll make sure. Thank you so much. And yeah. uh, James Cleverly was asked about this because he walked past those paintings with the former president of South Africa, and he said neither of them were bothered by any of this. You know, when the when the uh, state opening of Parliament happens every year in Parliament, the French ambassador has to sit underneath a painting of Waterloo, looking at another painting of Trafalgar. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, <laughs> there are much more important pressing issues around the world. The, the Chinese and the, and the Russians agree. will be laughing at us. Strong, yeah. confident nations okay. don't constantly navel gaze and uh, beat themselves up about their past, that they need to look forward and be champions for what Britain is best there at. There were fireworks behind you there. I'm not sure what that was I'm all sorry. about, Iman. Was this because you agreed on a point there? There I were thumbs was, up and right? then the fire... It was like the earth moved. Thank you for realising that. I didn't want to distract anyone from your point, Ralph. You, you made a valid point that I agreed with, and I, I put my thumbs up and I saw fireworks, and I got really excited. I do like fireworks. I do apologise. You, you make a valid point. I, I don't disagree with you. There are far more important things than paintings, okay. guys, and I think we can all agree with that. However, I will also say that paintings are really important. I, I just want to make two really quick points so I know we're running out of time. It's not about pride uh, or having a problem with your pride. Pride is really important for self-esteem, for every human being, for every community. Pride is so important. And that's why I need pride as a black person. So okay. when I walk into an office, I don't want your British pride to diminish mine. And that is what I'm here to talk about, Rafe. You have your, your pride, British no too. problem, sir. But if your pride diminishes my pride, if you want to hold on to statues, paintings, and whatever uh, artifacts you stole during the 50 or, or, sorry, the 50 countries in Africa that you colonized, if you want to steal Give things, if these are the things that give you your self-esteem, if these are the things that give you your pride, then now we have a problem. Guys, because the cloud is beating us. Um, and you're thank you. Me We've been proud to have you both on this past. morning. Thank you both very much indeed. We'll say thank you and good morning. Thank you very much indeed. And your views on all of this, very, very welcome. Get in touch with us. The new way, the way to do everything, which is that. GBnews.com GB forward slash, slash your say. say. Which is now, to be honest, a Paul Coit loving. Because we asked for what pe we, people love about Paul Coit and actually so many of you getting in touch about that. I really hope he's watching this while he's at home or reading them on the website. We're going to message him and say, have a look. Because that's the only thing, they do disappear after a few minutes. So you have to screenshot them or they'll be gone that's forever. Nice. That's, nice. that's um, very good. Keep your thoughts coming in and stay tuned our way. Alex Armstrong and Claire Muldoon with the papers in just a moment. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M6 in Cheshire is closed northbound from Junction 21 for the A57 at Warrington to 21A for the M62 after an accident. The long delays towards the closure and as you divert on the M54 in Shropshire, the eastbound exit at Junction 5, the A5 at Telford is closed where overnight roadworks have overrun. In Devon, the A377 is closed at Chumley because of a landslip. In Dorset, the A35 is closed westbound from the Charmouth roundabout to Axminster after an accident brought down a tree. Trains have been stopped between Salisbury and Westbury because of a fallen tree on the line at Warminster and there's a reduced rail service on a number of rail routes in England today because of industrial action. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. 
So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Uh, we've got Claire Muldoon and we've got Alex Armstrong and they had a great old kerfuffle earlier on. We, had, we were talking about lots and lots of things that has gauged a lot of reaction from you guys, which Isabel will reflect to you uh, shortly. Uh, one of the things, there's a lot of politicians and there's a lot of uh, reporters that have been caught up in um, uh, a sexting scandal mm -hmm. at, uh, at Westminster. Um, and, and this, um, Alex, is called a honey trap scandal. Mm. Um, so the uh, chief political correspondent at the BBC, Henry Zeffman, um, he says he was approached um, through all of this yep. um, as well. And just to quote Nadine Dory, she says, it makes you wonder why Tory high command is so protective of RAG, a mm -hmm. politician whose attributes and achievements in Westminster no, amount rag? to very little. Rag. William RAG is the man who's been held responsible for setting He's the also traps. deputy chairman. Well, I think he stood believe. down last night. Oh, he did. He That's right. He night. did. Yes. Right. So... I mean, look, it, it, I, I think this is a really interesting topic to talk about, and I do think the press have been speaking enough about it, so I'm really pleased we are, because there, is, there has been a lot of scandal, and it always seems to be the Tory government coming out and backing, and backing them, backing these MPs. And quite frankly, this, this whole you know, honey trap scandal, as it's being called, to have Jeremy Hunt come out and say, Oh, I'm, I think he's very brave. I mean, let's just not for, remember, let's just remember, William Ragg was not the whistleblower. It was actually Luke Evans MP who was the whistleblower. So they're, they're protecting a man that, that um, really was sitting on his laurels while this was all unfolding. No, now, Nadine, Nadine Doris, Nadine Doris mm. has been good about this today. She's just texted and she's watching the programme. Good morning, yeah. Nadine. And um, she's saying this Ragg story is going to keep unfolding. Mm. And on her ex account today, she's saying Ragg was no stranger to setting career ending honey traps. Mm. As I detail in her tweet, she says, the big spender at Westminster, always throwing parties, buying large expensive rounds. What's the real reason number 10 are protecting him? Mm. Yeah, I, I, well, this is a good, a good point. And I think what Nadine's saying is that, I mean, this is a guy, by the way, who told Boris to stand down due to, uh, you know, not withhold, upholding parliamentary standards. The and Chris Pincher groping allegations at, and all of that. Exactly. Party gate. I think, yeah, Nadine's basically saying that that, that look, this is a this is this there's more there's more to come here. You haven't seen you haven't seen the bottom of the barrel, unfortunately. I think it's and going further up the food chain. I yes, think that's the issue. Possibly. And I think they're trying to blanket it any further yeah. um, flames. They're mm. trying to put a blanket over it. Mm. We well, um, can read all the juicy details in Nadine's column in the mail today, page Claire, 17 on that one. Claire, I was talking to a, an MP mm. um, this week and uh -huh. quite in depth, and he was we were just talking socially about being an MP and staying while they read bills 
and basically the only thing that you, you have to do in the house, you could, you could be at home, yeah. talk about working from home, mm. you could work at home, they could read these bills, they could vote, with press a button for really? it. No, home? no, 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 they right. could, ah, but right. they don't. Right, and he says it's so old boy, um, you know, it's about, it's anti-woman, it's uh, very pro-man, and basically all there is to do throughout your day is to drink. So people drink. No, they drink a lot, and then they make mistakes. Discounted alcohol mm. as well. Yeah, yes, discounted alcohol. Subsidised. And they get involved in By us. affairs. Mm. They get uh, and and and. They're staying uh, away from home. Same sex affairs, all that sort of thing. They're away from home. Mm. Um, all sorts of things. It's it's a cauldron for disaster. Yeah. Being being an MP. It is, and it's an absolute um, diabolical position to be in. There are no MPs, I don't think now, that would actually represent the true root of where they are a constituent True. MP for. I think you should do away with career politicians. I don't like the senior members of any party flying in the best candidate to win a safe seat um, or turn another seat because they are charismatic, because they're the big gun. I think MPs should live and work in the constituents that they, the constituency that they want to represent and do that for at least a minimum of five years before they even stand. They need to know that when they're, mem when they're a member of parliament, when they're sitting in parliament, when they're drawing up bills, when they're going to vote on bills, they should be voting for the people that elected them in but their constituency. I don't know who your political heroes are, but I mean, if you look at a lot of the big successful politicians mm. in recent years, most of them have struggled to get seats for a long time. When you think about Blair, you think about, um, I'm pretty sure it was the case for. Well, I wish Blair had struggled a bit um, more before he got his seat. Forrest, but anyway, he's got no connection. Yeah, with, with, with Marshall, Uxbridge, you, you, did he? You, and I don't know yeah. even if Rishi Sunak got any connection well, to Richmond in Yorkshire. But it, they get, you know, these people yeah. often have to be moved to seats where they've got. That's a what seat. I've just said. That's what I'm just saying. We'd lose yeah. out on a lot of our, our previous leaders. Oh, I don't think that's a big loss, to be honest with you, Isabel. I think that, you know, they need to raise through the ranks, work, work their way up, yeah. you know, and, and try and get to grips with the country. And do you know what else? That would actually help voting for general elections, because now people yeah. tend to vote for the party instead of locally. Yeah, um, American I style. think I, where I totally agree with you, Claire. The system stinks. Yep. And at some stage, we're going to have to reform the system mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, that deals with Westminster, and whether it's five years or whether it should be mm -hmm. more than that. And, and the business that they put ministers in, they suddenly, one minute, Isabel's the Minister for Defence, and then they say, right, we've got rid of her, we'll put Eamon in as Minister yeah. for yeah. Defence. Yeah. Well, what that, do I know I about know. that? You know, and then well, journalists the like us interview servants. them, and yeah. they can't answer. Back after this. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues, you think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet-style thing. And some of the things that Humza Yousaf said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two-hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be, in particular, abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity, to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful that you know even after years of trying to study it i can't understand why people hold this belief but it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce so it tried to introduce gender self-id but that was overruled by westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government it's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law which sounds nice but isn't nice it actually criminalizes 
proper ethical treatment of gender confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards. And then this uh, hate crime law, which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual, reality based, clear, understandable way about all these measures. It all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes and that recognising that matters for women's rights especially. I'm Patrick Christie's every weeknight from nine I bring you two hours of unmissable explosive debate and headline grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interests of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When I was young, we used to go to my oh. uncle Tommy Bell. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have known what we were talking about in the break, we weren't sure as a panel where you're going with that. Um, yeah. But we're glad to hear it was your grannies. Carry on. I used to go to my uncle's, uncle's. My uncle uh, Tommy Bell's house, and he always used to talk about his glory hole. Oh. And um, and I'd never heard the word before. Mm. And basically, it was a it was an attic or or something that you would have under was the it stairs really? or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was in the he was in the Royal really? Navy and he was a deep <laughs> really? sea diver. Really, getting worse. And he would have his his helmet and everything in there. His helmet, his kids. Cool. We would we would <laughs> have I think a rummage. This might have been the PG version he gave you. <laughs> No, 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 really? no. So we had a rummage through the glory hole and whatever it is. No. So it's interesting that no, the, the word comes up again no. in, in yes. Lincoln, Alex. <laughs> yes. Lincoln glory hole. What is the Lincoln glory hole? <laughs> well, your helmet doesn't well, I just think that, it's Alex, very important to say Lincoln <laughs> County Council have said they are extremely happy that Lincoln glory hole has reopened. <laughs> it is, uh, <laughs> it's been getting to a point, and this is comments from the public, it's been getting to a point, it's been a long, arduous process for everyone involved simply because the nature of the glory hole and where it sits. <laughs> now, this is a pathway in Stop Lincolnshire. It. I'm just reading the comments You're from the too council, much fun. right? Alex, uh, it's, it's been a long time and it feels like delay tactics. It's been, I've been totally frustrated. It feels like they're just padding it out to get all the funding. <laughs> yeah. So this is, is a pathway in Lincoln that's eight been... Eight minutes to eight in yeah, the morning. Yeah, well, we thought we'd give you all a lovely, you. a lovely laugh today. Yeah. Well, well, well. There's, um, there's similar sort of walkways in Northern Ireland. We have the Gobbins and we have um, Carricka Reed rope bridge, which is a whew, scary experience yeah. you know, to go across um, that as well. So it's nice to hear that the Glory Hall is open for business again in Lincoln. <laughs> yes, Very good. Yes. Now, you want shoes. You're going to talk oh, about shoes. Oh, yes, let's do a shoes section. Um, there's a couple of shoes making the headlines. Not only have we got <laughs> Rishi Sunak crashing Adidas Samba's sales. Mm. I'm gutted because I have a pair and I love them. But actually, Chuck I think out. you look quite cool in them. I, no. I, that's not a political statement. I don't have a problem with the Prime Minister wearing those. And we've also got Zendaya. Uh, pl wearing stilettos with tennis balls. You know, when I the saw heels. the picture of her this morning on the Times Online, I mm. didn't realise, I didn't even recognise it was her. What a chameleon she is. She's from as the an film actress. June. She is from the yes. film June, and she's also Brilliant going film. out with Spider Man. Yeah. She um, is. And those shoes, she's got a Loewe dress on, dressed like a tennis player, but the stiletto shoes with a tennis ball. Mm. Yeah. The most extraordinary thing. Give me trainers any day. Give me a pair of sambas. <laughs> you can do the samba and sambas, at least. You can't do anything like that in those. Oh, I think she'll have good support on the hills with that, wouldn't she, bouncing along? do you think? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's potentially. It's probably I mean, a little I... bit more surface area than yeah. the stiletto. I Amen, don't know. what's your view? I'm do you trying like to them? listen to how long we've got left. Huh? 115, sorry. What's my view on these? Um, I think, I think... Um, they look well. Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't be for me, but um, I think... It wouldn't it, be for you. It, it draws attention. I mean, you know, she's, she's an actress. I don't know who she is, but she's very beautiful. And, um, and um, yes. Have you not watched what? June yet? Watched no, June? Not no. your cup of tea? Do you no. not like sci-fis? 
Um, no, I've never. I've just never watched June. Is it worth? Is it worth watching? Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. We, me and Claire were talking about this about in the green room. Mm, great, great films. I've just started it actually, only because of the rave reviews that Alex gave it mm. and my children. And June two apparently is extraordinarily wonderful. Mm. So I'm halfway through this one, which is great. Very and good. And she's in it. But you're right. She's a chameleon. She's unrecognisable she sometimes. Uh, absolutely, I did yeah. not recognise her. Yeah. Up and coming A lister, isn't she? She's well, like she's the new Angelina Jolie. Yeah, yeah well, you're right. Power yeah. couple there. Um, just like you two. Yes, Emma absolutely. Susan and Alex Armstrong, thank you for taking us through the papers. We're looking forward to having you back in half an hour. Great. For now, though, here's Annie Shuttleworth with your forecast. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. It should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M18 in South Yorkshire, there's a lane closed northbound at Junction 4 for the A630 at West Moor to the northeast of Doncaster after an accident causing queues. The M6 in Cheshire is closed northbound from Junction 21 for the A57 at Warrington to 21A for the M62 at the Croft Interchange after an accident. There are long delays towards there and as you divert. On the M56 in Cheshire, there's a lane closed eastbound after an accident between Junction 7 and 6 from Bowden to Hale causing delays. Trains have been stopped between Salisbury and Westbury because of a fallen tree on the line at Warminster. There's a reduced rail service on a number of rail routes in England again today because of industrial action and hover travel services to and from the Isle of Wight are suspended between South Sea and Ryde because of poor weather conditions. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel... 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, uh, quickly approaching 8 o'clock on this Tuesday morning. Tuesday the 9th of April, you're very welcome to Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. New developments in the manhunt for Habiba Masoom, suspected of stabbing a woman to death in Bradford on Saturday. Mark White has the latest. Massour has, uh, it is emerged that Massour, according to court documents, was on bail, accused of making threats to kill and assault his victim, who died on Saturday. Millions of people across North America have uh, turned their eyes to the sky overnight to catch a glimpse of the solar eclipse, and that is what it looked like. Labour's pledged to crack down on tax dodgers in a bid to fund their pledges for the NHS. Earlier, we spoke to Shadow Financial Secretary James Murray on GP News. People right across Britain are paying more and more tax. Uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. Yes, Labour saying that if elected, they'll spend another 500 million a year, and that will enable them to bring in another five billion pounds a year, um, currently being lost through tax avoidance and evasion. Easier said than done, of course. And um, today marks three years since the death of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. We'll be speaking to royal biographer Ingrid Stewart about his life and legacy. Good morning. There's wet and windy weather on the way for many today with rain and wind warnings in force. Find out all the details with me a little later on. Uh, let's bring you more on that Bradford murder story. Court documents have revealed that the murder suspect in the fatal stabbing was out on bail after making threats to assault and kill uh, the woman who was attacked. The man police are looking for is 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, uh, a Bangladeshi national who came to Britain, uh, like so many do, on a student visa. Anna Riley with more. Good morning, Anna. Good morning. Yes, it's now four days into the manhunt for the prime suspect, Habiba Massour, 25-year-old Bangladeshi national, as you say, that came to the UK on a student visa. He is uh, accused and, and police are trying to find him after a woman, 27-year-old uh, Kasima Akhtar, uh, was murdered in broad daylight on Saturday afternoon near Bradford City Centre. As you've mentioned, court documents show that that the prime suspect, Massam, was out on bail. He was bailed uh, by a magistrate in Manchester on November the 27th uh, after making threats to kill uh, the, the woman who sadly died uh, and also assaulting her. He denied those charges and pleaded not guilty, but he was released on bail. But that was something that prosecutors disagreed with at the time. So that's the latest information that we have on this case. Yesterday here in Bradford at the, the building behind me, uh, West Yorkshire Police held a press conference in which they gave the latest updates. They said that a 23-year-old man had been arrested on suspicion of a an offender. That was following raids in Oldham, Burnley, 
and Chester, where Massam is known to have links. They also said that the last sighting of him was at 3.42 in the afternoon on Saturday, getting off a bus in Bradford and heading to a local park. That was the last sighting they had of him. And they've said that they are appealing for people with CCTV footage, dash cam footage, and in particular taxi drivers who may have given him a lift to come forward. He may be armed. Uh, police are saying don't approach him, but contact them on 999 if there is a sighting. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Um, uh, we're going to bring in... Uh, now, uh, who are we bringing in? We're We've bringing got... in Oliver Lawrence. Yes. La Oliver Lawrence, uh, host of Protect and Serve podcast, former police officer yourself, Oliver. Um, what do you make of the way things are going and the fact that, uh, you know, the image of Habib Masum is, uh, is out there for everybody to see? And indeed, you can see his, uh, his video casts online. You can indeed. Good morning, Eamon. Good morning, Isabella. And this morning. has got all the traits of the recent case we had down in Clapham with Mr Azidi, who was on the run for several days before being determined to have fallen into the Thames. So let's hope the police will be moving at rapid pace here to obviously to gather up all the evidence they possibly can in trying to identify the last steps of Mr Mazoom prior to evading them. Obviously, that job is made incredibly uh, much more difficult when it would appear members of the community or his associates are assisting him in evading police, which is going to make things a little bit more complicated. But let's hope that these people are held accountable for supporting him in his actions in the coming days and weeks. Um, Oliver, there are questions, though, to be asked about how he was able to be out and about um, threatening this woman, uh, given that he had been released on bail, accused of having threatened her with, with assault and also with death. Um, the Greater Manchester Police have referred themselves to uh, the watchdog over all of this. But there will also be questions about how he uh, has entered the UK, how he's been able to stay here. It seems as though, as you say, comparisons being made with Abdul Azadi, and a lot of people very frustrated that folks like this are in our country. Isabel, these incidents leave us asking more questions than they do answer. And, and let's, you know, every three days, um, statistically, we lose a female in this country to an act of violence at the hands of a former male partner or current partner. They are horrifying statistics of which none of us uh, should be proud of. And we should be doing everything we can to bring that to the attention of the government. Um, quite rightly, uh, people are asking serious questions as to who this individual is, how did he get into the country, what were the vetting levels that he went through, and ultimately we sit here today trying to make sense of this, sense of, sense of this all, but let's look at the criminal justice system we have to say has potentially failed this poor lady and left a child without a mother. An individual who's committed an act of assault and threatened to kill this woman is now wanted in connection with that same female's murder. I don't know what more has to happen in society for our government and our criminal justice system and our policing services to realise how significant an issue this is in our society. Yeah, incredibly yeah. sad. And although the child was unharmed in the pram, now without a mother, um, and, you know, it's unclear who the father is, but, yeah, it, it, if it is this individual, you know, they're likely to be behind bars. Yeah, ter so, um, terrible, terrible situation. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Oliver. Thanks for your, for your take on things. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, to politics now, the Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves today, she'll speak, she'll announce a new crackdown on tax, do tax dodgers. Basically, we're talking about non-doms here and we're also talking about uh, big companies which uh, set up businesses in the country but don't pay the proportionate mm -hmm. amount of tax and all of this. And the idea is hit these people and then, as they will say, help fund the NHS. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get the thoughts of our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, who joins us from Westminster. Good morning to you, Catherine. Um, no coincidence that uh, the Tories stole her non-DOM policy and she's had to come up with uh, another plan to plug uh, these pledges that she's made. Uh, will this work? Because the Tories have said they've tried 200 measures to claw back tax that is owed. It's not as simple as that. Yes, it's very easy to say, isn't it, that we'll crack down on tax avoidance and evasion. And in fact, it's the sort of thing that incoming governments do tend to promise. Uh, but it is, as you say, much, much easier said than done. That's something that Paul Johnston of the Institute from fiscal st of Fiscal Studies has been saying. It's very easy to throw these numbers out there, but the truth is they don't know how much it will raise, but at least they're trying. So there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, they're spending an additional, I think, 550 million 
to HMRC on uh, several hundred, sorry, thousand compliance officers um, with a view to cracking down on tax dodging effectively. They're saying that they hope that that will bring in an extra five billion a year by the uh, end of the next parliament. And then attached to that, they are also cracking down on non-DOMs. Now, as you mentioned, uh, that was a plan that they've had for a long time to abolish non-DOM status. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, came along and nicked that just a few weeks ago. But Labour are still saying that the Conservatives' plan still has loopholes that can save people huge amounts of money in the next year or two, and they are going to come down hard on those. They say that will bring in another two billion or so. Now, the money they say that they're going to save, um, some of that money is earmarked for free breakfast clubs. Some of it is earmarked for uh, more GP appointments. Um, some of it is just to be kept back for, for other things. But I think worth noting that whoever is in power after the next general election, there is not a lot of money around. National debt is huge. We've been on massive spending sprees, uh, war in Ukraine, uh, covid funding people's energy bills. So there are going to be very, very difficult decisions for the next government around tax and spending, no matter who is in power. OK, Catherine, thanks very much indeed. Uh, other news, let's bring you up to date with what's happening in the time, 10 past eight. The Post Office Horizon public inquiry resumes today. Campaigner Alan Bates, he'll make his first appearance. He's calling for bonuses paid to bosses to be clawed back. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led to the Post Office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has met Donald Trump at his Mar-a-Lago residence in Florida before holding talks with the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Uh, the former president and Lord Cameron discussed the war in Ukraine, NATO and the Middle East, and it is the first summit between a senior government minister and the former president since he left office in 2021. Campaigners are calling for the government to ban 25 pesticides which contain forever chemicals uh, found in common British fruits, vegetables and spices. They have prompted alarm over potential impacts on public health. Out of all the items tested, strawberries found to be the worst affected. North America was dazzled by a total solar eclipse overnight that was watched by millions across the US, Mexico and Canada. The rare event, which won't happen again for a further 20 years, left a large ribbon of land in complete darkness as groups gathered to watch. Earlier we spoke with astronomer Mark Thompson. Being a very specific area on Earth to, to witness it, um, and of course uh, yesterday and a few hours ago, people in North America and Mexico were lucky enough to, uh, to witness the event. Um, wet and windy out there overnight, and I'm afraid it's more of the same. Not the greatest of forecasts at the moment. I suppose they call it April showers for a reason. We'll be getting a look um, at your forecast in a minute. We just want to say thank you to all of you. You've been getting in touch by our new portal on our website. If you haven't been already, you go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Lots of you saying, I found it, I'm having a go, it's yeah. OK, and interacting with each other. You get a thumbs up, thumbs down um, option on there as well. Lots of you interacting with each other. Lots of love for Paul Coit. What else have they been saying? Ian has found it too, and Ian uh, basically saying um, that he's lying on a settee watching us this morning uh, and then flicking his eyes towards blackbirds. And this is an interesting point. And he's wondering what the blackbirds are, are on his lawn for. But what, they, what they're there for, the blackbirds take the moss from your lawn. I watch this, and I've got, I've got pigeons that do this as well. And, uh, and they pick out all the moss and, and, of course, they find little bugs and insects there as well. He's listening to us, listening to use to, use to, that's us, again. Uh, Leslie, the thing that irritates me more than anything is how blasé the whole establishment is towards immigration in general, whether illegal or legal. So, Leslie, your point is that we're not taking it seriously enough. And I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think people who have had very reasonable arguments about migration and illegal immigration, mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, you can't do this or that to people, 
they're not really looking at the figures. And if you're looking at four or 5,000 per weekend arriving in the country and all the people that have arrived so far, however sad the story is, however awful things are, yeah. It's really, really yes, got to the point of no return. Oh, you know, the, the figures aren't quite like that at the weekends, but certainly it is this, it's the students legally coming into this country that make up the majority of um, immigration figures, legal immigration figures, but do we really get to grips with that? And, you know, here we are with Habiba Masoom on the run, one of these people that has come into the country through that legal route. Um, do we need to look at all of that? Let so us know your... So is that being blasé mm -hmm. um, about the whole thing, whether uh, illegal people entering the country or whether legal people entering the country. Mm -hmm. What is the answer to this? Somebody somewhere is going to have to stand up and say, no more, I'm sorry, I don't know what your trouble is in your country, but we can't take you either. We haven't got the conditions, we haven't got the infrastructure for this, we haven't got the budgets, we haven't got the money, we, haven't, we can't look after our own people. I, th I think it's amazing in this country that we just can't look after homeless people. Absolutely pathetic, incredible that we can't. What happened to Prince William and all this talk that he was suddenly going to he's end still homelessness? Still trying to work on that. Yeah, he's still. Where? Announced. What have you he's, heard? He's, he's, he's recently announced building a whole bunch of properties down in Cornwall. Six months ago, he announced well, that. Oh well, I don't know. You know I, I think he's gone. I think he's gone very, very quiet on this. Well, he's been a and... bit distracted, hasn't he, in recent weeks? But um... all right. Well, nothing's being done about it. That's basically <laughs> it. I, I just have my say. I think I agree with Leslie. People get blasé. Everybody grab a headline and then nothing seems to be done about mm -hmm. things. I mean, my frustration if I was a politician would be if I said it, I mean it. If I said it, do it. Not, well, we'll think about it or we'll form a committee about it or we'll have another discussion about it. Get it done. Here's your weather. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force, and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with a wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. It should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. A bit of escapism now, oh, away definitely. from all the doom and the trouble and <laughs> hubble that goes on and the bad weather and everything. This is our biggest giveaway of the year so far, your chance to win 10,000 quid. And we're so blasé about that, aren't we? £10,000 in cash would be enough of a gift on its own, but we're also offering travel items, but wait for it, a Greek cruise worth... 10,000 quid as well. Yeah, it looks right. very fancy. So you put it all together and it could go to you. Have a go. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. 
gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good luck indeed. And if you do get hold of that cruise, how Bring lucky us. are you? <laughs> we want to get on that ship. It looks incredible. It's just the music puts me in a good mood. Have you ever done a cruise? I've not done a cruise, no. No. You've done a big boat. I've been on boats, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about the crossing to Santander in northern Spain when I was violently sick, but it uh, wasn't quite the same thing. Because that goes I mean, through the Bay of Biscay, Biscay which, yeah, is, which, which is, is which is pretty difficult. fancy. And I've been on day trips on boats, and, and I'm not a great sailor, but I've never done a cruise. You're a cruiser. Oh, gosh, yes, I could have been... Um, a captain. I mean, if this was Second World War, captain. I would be, yeah. I would be on the bridge. I have been a captain. <laughs> I've been wearing one of those duffel coats that they, <laughs> they wore in the cruel sea that Jack Hawkins wore, whatever it is, a duffel coat and a, and a cap. There's a very good movie out uh, with Tom Hanks called Greyhound, which I think is on Apple, Apple mm, TV. I don't have Apple TV. And uh, it's about convoy sh ships in the um, Second World War. Very good, very good. Just mm -hmm. uh, interesting. I like Tom Hanks movies, they're usually good. Then ships, you know, ships then transfer to starships mm -hmm. and Kirk. Mm -hmm. And so the bridge thing comes easy mm -hmm. to me. Well, I was going to say let's stick with the sea theme, uh, able seamen, because of course Prince Philip was himself an incredible, um, what is the word? W was he an admiral? Sailor. Well, sailor, yeah, I suppose. But he was quite senior and they, they think he could have been very, very successful if he hadn't become uh, the royal consort. Well, it is the anniversary of his death today, three years ago today. After the break, we'll be looking back on his life and legacy with Ingrid Seward. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion. People saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where we need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK. And we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer <laughs> day and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles. Absolutely. They just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always is looking ahead uh, actually politics aside what is genuinely the best thing for this country join me camilla tomini every sunday at 9 30 when i'll be interviewing the key players in british politics and taking them to task and this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial with an upcoming election looming over westminster now is the time for clear honest answers i agree and that's precisely what i'll get is he indecisive Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. 
only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Today, uh, three years since the death of Prince Philip. Uh, he was 99 years of age. He died at Windsor Castle and he was the longest serving royal consort in history. Well, joining us now to talk about his life and legacy is the editor in chief of Majesty magazine and the royal biographer Ingrid Stewart. Um, good morning to you. Lovely to have you on the programme. It still turns me cold um, remembering that moment that uh, I found at Operation Fourth Bridge was coming into play. That was to say that all the plans that the broadcasters and indeed the civil servants and the royal family and all the courtiers had in place was was being enacted because P Prince Philip had died. And it was the first, you know, major royal death that we had had in, in an incredibly long time. Do you remember where you were when you heard the news three years ago today? I was actually in the market <laughs> in Henley on Thames, uh, buying some buying some apples. <laughs> so not not in a very dramatic place, but I do remember the funeral very very well. I think I think we all do because it was so poignant, and it was I think it was the the Queen followed her government's COVID restrictions, so it was very very pared down, and also just to to let Aymer know he was Lord High Admiral Prince Philip. There we go. The Thank you. Yeah. Very it's a senior. wonderful title, isn't it? Lord yeah. High Admiral. Prince and he could and he could have gone all the way with his with his naval career, but but he put that to one side, didn't he? Well he had to when uh the Queen's father became really ill and he was he was um um on service in Malta and he realized then that his naval days were gonna be over and that he really had to, you know, had to do what what he was destined to do, which was support his wife, the Queen, as monarch. Ingrid, tell me about. I mean, we we talked about his military career there, so he was used to giving and taking orders there. Um, did he take orders in the royal household, or did he make the orders? Well, what happened was Philip started to make the orders because he saw that the household was run in a very inefficient way and he was extremely efficient man and he wanted things to run really smoothly so um he became a little bit unpopular because he started ma making quite sweeping changes within the royal household to make it more more efficient and um it wasn't always popular with with the sort of old established members of of the staff that were there Love story between the pair, though. Um, certainly, the Queen Elizabeth um, II was was madly in love with him, and um, I suppose what they had in common, um, apart from sort of both being aristocratic and, and royal, was a love of the country, a shared love of the country. I think they had all that. What they really had in common was this amazing sense of duty, and Philip always said, "You know, my duty is to support my wife as monarch." and and that's the position he never wavered from. What whatever else he did, he was always supporting his wife, the Queen. And I and I think that really big sense of duty was what held them both together over the years. Apart from the other obvious things like his sense of humour, his loyalty, um, and his his ability just to get on with life and yeah. get and make things happen. He made things happen. Yeah, he he was. Uh, I've been saying this morning. In in my opinion, he was very much the enforcer. Um, you know, he was the sheriff in town. Uh, he made the the rules, and um, people would come to him for advice, and I'm sure he would tell them what to do uh, in in no small way. How would you see his role in the general family circle? Well, in the family circle, he was. He, in a way, I suppose he was a bit of a house husband, although he would loathe that expression, because the Queen was was you know her, when her father died suddenly, 
1952, she was propelled into a position that she hadn't expected for, for a, a, you know, at least another 10 years. So Philip had to take over the running of the household, the, the, the running of the family. Um, he made the decisions. She 100% agreed with him. And, and then he got on with it. What did you make of his relationship or how he viewed Meghan Markle? Oh, I think Prince Philip was very canny about people. Um, and he didn't always see bad in them. He, he tried to see good in them. But I think he just couldn't get away from the fact of the similarities between uh, Meghan and Harry and uh, Edward and Mrs. Simpson, if you like. There are so many similarities there, which is why he used to call her uh, the Duchess of Windsor. I mean, not to her face, obviously. We used to call her Dow, D-O-W. <laughs> What about the relationship that was sometimes fraught, especially in the early years, with our now king? Uh, what do you think Prince Philip, given what you know of him and you've written books about him, would make about um, King Charles's reign so far? And I suppose the challenges that the royal family are now facing, do you think he would agree with this slimmed-down monarchy, given, you know, their health and, and apparent frailty at the moment? I think he would totally agree with the slimmed-down monarchy. And I think he would be very, very proud of his son. He wasn't always proud of his son. I mean, he was a very tough father, and they didn't get along in the in the early years. Obviously, they did later, but I think he would be really proud of the way that, that Charles has sort of immediately implemented what he said he was going to do. He said he wanted a slim-down monarchy, and that's what he's organised. That's what he's now got. It, it is a little bit... Uh, too slim down at the moment, perhaps, but he's coping. He just doesn't want the burden of too many royals upon the British taxpayer. Well, we'll remember him with fondness today on this April the 9th, the third anniversary of his passing. Ingrid, thank you very much indeed for, for sharing your thoughts and your opinions with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, stay with us. Lots more coming your way. Claire Muldoon and Alex Armstrong have been on fire this morning. Uh, we've really enjoyed going through the papers with them. We hope you will too if you haven't already. Stay with us for that. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in West Dumbartonshire on the A82. The outside lanes closed southbound when there's an accident just after the Dunglass roundabout at Bowling Course and queues heading towards Glasgow. Train services are suspended between Paisley Canal and Glasgow Central because of a signalling problem. There's a reduced rail service on a number of routes in England today because of industrial action. Now the A1 in Tyne and Weir is partly blocked at Junction 66 by the Angel of the North after a vehicle caught fire. On the M18 in South Yorkshire, there are north Bound queues towards Junction 4 at Westmore near Doncaster after traffic was stopped because of an accident. The M6 in Cheshire is closed northbound from Junction 21 at Warrington to 21A for the M62 after an accident with long delays towards there. And in Paris, the A4067 is closed near Cray because of a landslip. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News.
Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, one thing I know is that a lot of you watch us and listen to us on the radio from around the world, mm. various places around the world, as far away as Australia, New Zealand, whatever as well. And we've got a big audience uh, on satellite in Europe as well. Mm. Uh, Alex Armstrong, the political commentator, and Claire Muldoon, the uh, superb commentator <laughs> on <laughs> anything right. and everything, journalist, broadcaster... Unbelievable. Rack on. Uh, Unbelievable. But, Claire... Um, would your dream be to buy a house in Spain or to move in Spain? Because there's a scheme there, a golden visa scheme. Mm. Uh, tell us what it was and what's happened to it. Right, so in answer to your question, no, I would rather uh, be able to buy a property in this country before even thinking about buying a second property anywhere else. OK. But Spain has put an end now to the golden visa that triggered a property boom in Spain. We're talking all over Spain, but necessarily the Costa del Sol, um, and, and all down the lower um, eastern part of Spain, where people in this country thought for their retirement they would love to go, spend the retirement over there, they've worked really, really hard, they've bought somewhere, let's go and do it. Perfect climate, perfect everything else. And now, Spain has now said, well, we're actually withdrawing these visas. Mm. So that's basically making people having to sell up but that, what they, the knock-on effect for that is, I think, people in Spain will be able to afford houses now. Yes, I see what you're saying here. It's like living in a holiday town yes. or something like that. But like Hastings are, are, are or Cornwall sure or someone. people have to sell up? To, they've already got their property. Can they not stay there? Well, they can, but today, 94 out of every 100 visas of this nature are linked to property investments that's concentrated in large cities. So what it's saying as well is the culture minister, the spokesman for the radical left-wing party that's now in, in yeah. residency, yeah. last year, uh, the year up in November the 8th, the visas enabled the purchase of 635 homes worth more than half a million euros. So but the decision would let the government fight yeah, speculative investment. Each. Yes. But, you know, you, you, I can't be a hypocrite on this because I, I say to people, lots of people coming here to the UK that they're pushing up house prices in this country and it, it making it impossible for me to buy a home. I'm a young, per, a 30-year-old man. I, I, I will struggle to purchase a home in London. So I, I kind of have to sympathise with, yep. with the Spanish um, on this one because at the end of the day, they need to prioritise their people and say, if our own people can't buy homes because wealthy British people are coming here and we do have bigger salaries than Spanish people, I, I understand understand the prioritisation um, of doing well, that. Well, the Brits have given a huge amount to the Spanish economy. Well, that's yep. very true. Years, and yep. all that investment, not just in tourism, yep. but yep. by people going over there to spend their hard-earned cash, true. this pushes them away. And I think it just, it, it, it's sort of a little bit left-wing politics of envy here. Yep. And I don't think it's of envy because the decision would actually enable Spanish people to buy properties because there were initially speculative investments by Russians, Chinese and well, Brits. There's already... I mean, it's so complex because, you know, there's huge unemployment in Spain. They're not suddenly going to magically have enough cash to buy properties just because the Brits have left. Um, I, I think it's a shame to be pushing... Well, but um, they would also... Uh, I look at your situation and, and mm. because there's so much foreign investment, China now particularly, yeah. um, people buying apartments in London... Mm. Impossible. I would look at yep. your, the situation and say, I mean, unless you've got a minimum or 500 or 600,000 quid, what the hell do you do well, in London? You know, I'm a born and bred Londoner. I was raised in, in Harrow in North West London. My grandma, she bought her house for 11,000 pounds in Harrow in Kenton. That house is worth about, close to a million. Mm. 
I, that's an incredible... It's crazy. To think that I'd even be able to buy a house in my hometown is impossible mm. for me, and it's impossible for the foreseeable future. Mm. I think that's a really sad state that we've got to, and I, I do, I do sympathise with countries trying to reverse that, and I understand exactly what you're saying. We've, we've put a lot into that economy, and there will be towns that are made up of Brits that yep. will suffer s severely because they'll have a mass exodus of people. I sympathise with them Absolutely as well. Furious about this. Yeah, I do um, get and that. It's impossible now for Brits to to be in Europe, really, in in, in whether it's second home yeah. or, or retirement property. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, um, what did you make of, or what did you see? I mean, you won't have seen it, but you, you will have um, heard about it and you watched pictures on our programme. Run those pictures of the, um, the moon eclipse there, if, if you can. Um, so, so, Alex, what, what did you make of uh, the interest in it? Oh, I, I, I think it was a fascinating series of events that led up to the eclipse, actually. But first of all, I'll say that the, it's beautiful. What, what a thing to witness. Um, very, very rare. And just to give the audience some perspective on this, the, the, the dinosaurs never would have had an eclipse. The, the moon is now at a position between the Earth and the sun where it's just in our lifetimes, in human existence, where this will happen. And it won't, as the moon moves further away from the Earth, ever happen in, in a few hundred thousand years' time. We'll never get that again. But the interesting thing, about all of this was the massive amount of crazy conspiracies oh. in America that came out of it. You know, people saying it was the end of the world, that this was uh, running along this big uh, equator that was going to blow up and, and people were predicting Believing the end of the it. world. Believing the conspiracy. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands well, of people. Me, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. We haven't played the sound of some of these events where people were watching. It was like the thing about Americans is they love a whoop, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what I think is awesome about an eclipse is how everything falls silent. Silent, yeah. Mm. Actually, you can't hear the Eerie. silence because they are going, oh, my God! <laughs> and crying. I mean, the hysteria yeah, over an eclipse. It's not very British, was it? <laughs> it wasn't like that in Cornwall no. when I watched the eclipse. No, you know? yeah, yeah, much more peaceful in our country, yeah. for sure. Yeah, anyway. But beautiful event, beautiful. And the next one in the UK will be in 2090. So if oh. you are, you, many of us won't be alive to see you, including myself. You might yeah. be alive. Oh, I, I will be pushing it. I'll be pushing it. <laughs> I'll be pushing my hundreds. Oh, oh but there we go. OK. Claire, what do you want to talk about? Right, so we go to... We'll have one more serious one. We'll, I think we'll talk about the Royal Mail. Uh, yeah. They're not going to... Because your brother's a postman, isn't he? Yeah. So let's go to the Mirror, page 23. And that says that letter writing is actually out of the out of the windows now. Yeah, it doesn't and, surprise me. Well, it doesn't surprise me either. If you give a child an envelope or even a postcard if you go on holiday, they won't even know where to put I the address. They're the only ones who actually write. Because they do thank you letters and things, but no not, adult. Not does. a lot of them do. And I always send a card. I always yeah. do it through the post and everything else. And it's so sad that the Royal Mail is a complete write off. They're diminishing people's ability to write letters, they're diminishing people's ability to write thank you notes or send birthday cards. Is it their There's... fault or is it just the demands? Well, it is demand as well, but they should be. Pushing against the demand. They should be enabling it. And now what they're doing is actually stopping second-class stamp um, service. Do you remember the days you used to get your first class in the morning and then your second class in the afternoon? Yes, you used to have two deliveries. Yes. Mm. Most of the thing. But, but you, you see... don't remember uh, that. It, no, I'm just, I a guy, no, I'm that. just saying, I was like... Mm. Mm. I was like, yes, sounds I like a bad idea. So, sounds like the good old yeah. days, well, Isabel, well, it doesn't it? It's not, I mean, the, the thing is, that's not the, the fault of the Royal Mail or the Post Office. That's the fault of allowing competition. So you don't go... You, you've got all these other competitors delivering your, your mail or whatever. Not that I would think of writing a letter and posting it through DHL. Or no! I don't, I don't know. But there's there's competition everywhere. Everybody's arriving at your door from Deliveroo to Amazon mm. to whatever, and they're all posting things that, that take work away from the Royal Mail. Which surely. is a shame, which is an absolute shame, so because what do you do? the postie was... The, I, I still it's, know my... I used to always know my postie. Yes, but don't I, know I them now. So it was the GPO. You know, you had no other operator but the GPO to which do your telephone telephones. Or and that was all... I mean, you know, I'm a great fan. One operator for your train system, you know, all yeah. of that. But you, you look and it worked, it goes. though. It worked. And look what's happened now. It's so disparate. Disparate. You, yeah, you can buy a train ticket on any single app, but you, there's terms and conditions for everyone. If you don't go direct to the train, mm. then you don't get a reserved seat. Okay. You pay it an admin fee. So, Royal Mail, come okay. on, please. Well, you've hit the buffers there as we go to the break, and uh, we're going to come back. We've got lots more things to, to talk about and to get you laughing, crying, <clears throat> and maybe... <laughs> Sniggering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument saying, for no, me. What, okay, oh, what, 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 my guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, um, we're not going to play Scrabble, but we're going to talk Scrabble. Mm. Um, and Alex has got a, an innovation. And uh, <laughs> tell us what it is and why. So, um, the Telegraph, page three. So, Scrabble um, is now going to be made more inclusive. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know Sorry, everyone at home's I'm thinking. I'm a purist when it comes to Scrabble. Oh, well, no, it's, it's a bit bonkers. So, so, what they're doing is they're printing a new version of Scrabble on the back of the what? existing version to dumb it down <laughs> for people who don't know very much about the dictionary, which I think oh, is... Oh, so you can just make up words. <laughs> I think oh, so. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Break. So, they're, they're saying to be more inclusive and less intimidating. I'm like, well, for goodness sake, if you can't even speak English or write it, then what are you doing playing Scrabble in the first place? Yeah. But this seems very desperate. I wonder if they're going to have more H's or H's. Hey. No. <laughs> and nice. also, um, it comes from the company, Scrabble's owned by Mattel. Now, Mattel yeah. has already emasculated poor Ken. Mm. Mm -hmm. so I, I just think... watched that film, finally. I caught up with the world. What I did you it think? Weekend. It was a bit trippy. Yeah, it's always it. rubbish. Um, oh, I don't think it was it made me angry. It... it made me angry. Oh, you've got to just lighten up, Claire. No! It's a bit of fun. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I don't think it deserved an Oscar. No! Yeah. It deserved an Oscar. And Mar I think Margot Robbie was sensational. Margot Robbie was, as was Ryan, whom yeah. we absolutely adore. Mm -hmm. But, come on, they just... She completely discredited men for men and for men's sake. Uh, there's no point in making movies like that. Girls, when they were playing with Barbies, when I used to play with them and Cindy, you didn't see that she was below a man or if she was less than a man. She was a doll, and that's what it was. Mm. And the beginning sequence, title sequence of that, of those wee girls playing with dolls and then throwing that out as if that's, that's not something worthy of someone to do, to be a homemaker, to sit and play with dolls, mother. to be a mother, I find it mm. highly offensive. OK. Mm. Anyway, that's... 
Out from the same the Mattel out. Get them out. With inclusive scrap. <laughs> Chuck all your Mattel, yeah. Mattel stuff out. Get rid of it. I, I, when I think <laughs> of it, I had, I had so many dolls when I was young. I had, Explains uh, a lot, Eamon. Uh, <laughs> I had 13 action men. Oh, right. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And their tanks and things. I mean, that was, that was my thing. Yeah. And, but the whole concept of uh, playing with a doll, uh, imagining them alive and whatever, I totally get... I totally mm. get uh, it's wonderful, I think, that all of side that. of childhood Shame, is really, magical. isn't it? I used to love my action men as well. The kids just don't have them anymore. They've got iPads now, haven't they? Maybe yeah. they still play. Do they? There's no Do imagination. They? You, you, imagination is the yeah. word. And yeah. um, the thing is that we had to create our universe yep. around our toys, whatever they were, which I think is very good for you. The trouble is the universe is now made for people mm. on the, mm. the iPad. Well, I agree with mm. that, yeah, but you've just got to... Which stifles creativity and iPad. stifles imagination. Yeah. So we can only know what films we're going to be watching in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's talk about well, how long have we got? Because we want to make sure we don't miss out on camels. Oh, we'll save camels for a bit later then. Um, Claire, let's talk about Mary Beard. She'd love to join the Garrick Club. She what does. So many of us. <coughs> Probably Barbie. Why would you? Why would you want to join the Garrick Club? Well, that's well, a good because... question. Why would you? Why would you? I mean, boring, boring, stuffy, old boring place. I mean, you have to have been to these places. What you want is you want the accessibility. Mm. You want you don't want to be prevented from jo join, joining it. But I. You'd rather go to a good restaurant. So Mary Beard, of course, is the wonderful BBC historian who has done ama amazing work for getting history to kids. She's a great, great yeah. teacher, lecturer. She knows her stuff inside out. And she, of course, was lambasted when she arrived to pick up a BAFTA in almost like jeans and a leather jacket. And her hair was forlorn and she didn't have much makeup on. But she took that on the chin. She went, I'm not a model. I am not a superstar. I am a working historian. This is how I dress. This is how I present. Kudos to you. Fair enough. Do doff cap. And now she wants to. She would love to be a Garrick member. And I'm thinking there's part of me that thinks, why? And other, the other part is, are you doing that just to be the agent provocateur? Because everyone knows it is an, a man's club. But why would you want to? you know, go into that environment. I mean, part of me is to leave them to it. I mean, unless there are deals being done that women mm. don't have access to and whatever there. But, I mean, my experience of these these men's clubs, whatever they are, you know, when you get on a chair that rocks about a bit, I the table love that's it. not straight. It's fun. It's old fashioned. Well, yeah. it's, it's like Freemasonry, isn't it? It's a man's, it's a man's thing, traditionally. There, there are women versions of Freemasonry. But, it, it, but, you know, if you want to have, join something like the Garrett Club, just set one up for women. I, I don't that's see what a, the well, point is. Exactly. There are, there are well, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. My priest who married me, uh -huh. um, he's a member of the Savile Club because a lot of priests get discounted membership and he takes me regularly. It's a men, men's only club. But it's, it's a lovely environment. Yeah. You go along, you see lots of politicians. So how can he take you if it's a men's Women meeting? are allowed in as guests, you just can't be a member. Um, so the chaps will sit outside smoking sure. cigars, but, you know, as long as you dress up and look the part, you yeah. can have a lovely... It's just. A I don't see anything wrong with that. I really don't. And I quite like men being able to well, discuss issues well, by themselves. Here's but. something I see a lot right to a fine for missing a doctor's appointment. Mm. Uh, Alex, this is in... In France, how much are they going to fine yes. uh, patients? So they're going to be fining patients five euros per missed appointment. And, and they're doing this because they, in France they had 27 million no-shows. And I totally understand why, because we talk about our health services being, you know, uh, under uh, over-utilised mm. but under-resourced, and you wonder, well, how many doctors are just sitting there waiting for someone not to show up for 10 minutes that they could have been seeing someone who needs it? So I think this is a deterrent. We'll see if it works, because I think if it does work, it will be something introduced here. Yeah, do you know, it's, it's, it's inconsequential. I mean, the five euros isn't, isn't a lot no. to mm. penalise yeah. people with, but it may just lay down... A line mm. that people can't cross. I think so, but everyone who has um, uh, uh, got appointments in the NHS, you will see when you receive your letter, a missed appointment costs, say, £160, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's there in black and white. Mm. And it, I don't know if that works psychologically for people to think, oh, gosh, I, I must make that. But the appointment system in the NHS is such that you get cancelled appointments, you then get other appointments, you miss the follow-up because you've got a new appointment. The whole appointment system's a bit of a mm, wash. Yeah. If there was anything that I would agree with this is actually bringing it down a level and making if you miss a GP appointment because everyone knows when they are because you make them. Mm. Yeah, true. I mean, true. I had a um, hospital trip last week with my son to the fracture clinic mm. and um, I was so stressed we were going to miss this appointment 
appointment but mm. couldn't get a parking space in the hospital car yeah, park. Yeah. We went round and round mm. and round and round to the point I thought I was going to leave him yeah. to go into the hospital on his own with his crutches, <gasps> with his limp, um, and eventually I managed to get a space. But, yeah. you know, that's half the stress with it these is. things, missing your appointments. It is. Circumstances outside of your control. OK, are uh, we going to talk about camels? Yeah, let's get on to camels. Oh. Story of the day. <laughs> Story of the day. So, could camels replace cows in the climate change struggle. So this is a, a, an article that cow, uh, camels are better for the environment because they, excuse my French, they, they break wind. I'm not going to say excuse my French. They break wind a little bit less than cows do. But they also produce milk that's high in vitamin C and low in fat. No, thanks. So, uh, camel milk. <laughs> do you guys fancy flakes. some camel milk oh, in the morning? Camel milk cappuccino. Yeah, not, to go, please. Not yeah, do you know me. what they would ask you what? for that in response to that? How would you like that one lump or two? Oh, uh, that, <laughs> that, that, absolutely nailed, nailed that. Nailed it, nailed um, it. Um, I wouldn't like to milk a camel either. If you've ever ridden a camel, they are a little bit feisty. I don't they think are. we've got any camels in, in, the, in this country. Well, not I'm many of them. In the zoo. 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 Um, uh, no, the, the thing is, I think Isabel's right with the temperament. Um, cows, by and large, although you can be killed by cows, it has to be said, mm. they can attack you and all that sort of thing. But camels are a bit tetchy, mm. um, my experience um, mm. of them. But... Um, I just yeah. know, would you like a camel milk latte? Absolutely um, not. I can oh. so see this taking off in the east end of London. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Shoreditch. Shoreditch. <laughs> you read my mind as well. <laughs> take off things like llamas uh, and whatever, there'd be, there'd be more of those in uh, livestock in Britain mm. Than, mm. than you're seeing at the moment because they produce meat and wool and milk and but all that sort of stuff. The stench of a camel. We've oh, all smelled nice. camel, right? They, they're not nice smelling animals. Mind you, neither are cows, really. No. Do you, sm do you think cows? A, a cow poo smells better than camel poo. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, do I. Yeah. So do I. Mm. And on that thought, we'll leave you. Thank you very much, to Claire <laughs> and Alex. Here's Thank the you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force. Parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. Should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Now, train services in Scotland are suspended between Paisley Canal and Glasgow Central because of a signalling problem. There's also a reduced rail service on a number of rail routes in England today because of industrial action. Now, the A1 in Tyne and Weir is partly blocked where a vehicle caught fire on the roundabout at Junction 66 by the Angel of the North, causing delays. The M6 in Cheshire, just the outside lane that's closed now northbound after an accident between Junctions 21 and 21A from Warrington to the M62. Three out of four lanes now back open, but still long delays. And where you were diverting earlier, still really busy too. Train services are suspended northbound from Salisbury to Westbury. That's because of a fallen tree on the line at Warminster. Now that is the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, 
GBnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, fast approaching 9 o'clock, it's Tuesday the 9th of April. What are you doing today? We're doing this programme for another 25 minutes, so please stay with us. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster, breakfast on GB News. And there's new developments in the manhunt for Habiba Masoom. He's suspected of stabbing a woman to death in Bradford on Saturday. Yes, it's emerged from court documents that the prime suspect in this murder investigation was on bail, accused of making threats to kill and assaulting the victim. We'll have more very soon. Have a look at these pictures. Uh, this was the eclipse last night. Millions of people across North America uh, turning their eyes to the sky to catch a glimpse of the solar eclipse. Labour has pledged to crack down on tax dodges in a bid to fund their pledges for the NHS. We spoke to them earlier. People right across Britain are paying more and more tax. Uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. Yes, it sounds great, doesn't it? Labour saying they will bring in billions more by cracking down on tax dodgers. But it's much easier said than done. I'll bring you more shortly. Good morning. There's wet and windy weather on the way for many today with rain and wind warnings in force. Find out all the details with me a little later on. Is it those of boxes overflowing this morning? <laughs> yeah, and it's good because we've, we've cracked this. If you put that address up there... We've cracked this and people now know what to do. Yeah, so it's gbnews.com forward slash you'll say. It's no longer just my box, though. You can all see what everybody's saying. There's a debate about whether my glasses are real or not. Yes, I can, I'm afraid I'm losing my eyesight, apparently, so that is legit. There's a debate about where Paul Coit is. Uh, he's off for a couple of days, but don't worry, we haven't sacked him. He'll be back. Lots of you but talking. He's doing a very interesting thing. He's going with his daughter around the country because she's looking at university options. Mm. And, you know, should that be in Glasgow? Should that be in Liverpool? Should that be in Manchester? Birmingham, wherever, wherever, mm. wherever. I've given him my advice as to where it should be. But, um, but you know, there's so many of these cities are so good. Glasgow's yeah. good, Newcastle's good. You can't go good. wrong. It's just a good opportunity Manchester, to get away from brilliant. home. Although, who would want to leave Paul Coit? Um, and then, lots of you talking about Claire Muldoon and Alex Armstrong, saying what a great pairing. Love Claire. She always speaks her mind. Lots of you with views on the situation with the Spanish visas, saying this isn't about house prices. This is about pushing the Brits out. Um, and, yeah, so you're enjoying our new forum. And the good thing is you can interact with one another and, indeed, you can do thumbs up. 
thumbs down on each other's comments. So keep them coming in. Good. Keep them coming in. GBnews.com forward slash your say. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. So there we go. Uh, that's how you get in touch. You and can these also speak the... to us, although we're not, we don't feature in the promotion there. But remember, <laughs> Eamon else. will be devotedly responding to all devotedly. his messages. Yeah. Um, so these are the topics we want you to get in touch on this morning. Our top story um, is about this manhunt. New court documents have come to light that revealed that the murder suspect in the facial stabbing of a woman in Bradford over the weekend was actually out on bail after he'd made threats to assault and kill the okay. same woman. Let's go to Anna Riley. She'll put you in the picture with the latest on Habir. Assume uh, on this. Anna, good morning. Good morning. Yes, a truly shocking case. This manhunt continues for Habiba Masoom after a 27-year-old mother was stabbed in broad daylight in Bradford on Saturday afternoon. The victim has been named as Kulsama Akhtar. And as you say, it's emerged from court documents now that the victim in this uh, murder case was known to Masoom and that he was in fact, out on bail after being accused of making threats to kill and assaulting her. He pleaded not guilty in a, in a magistrate in Manchester on November the 27th to these charges. He was given bail despite objections from prosecutors to this. And as part of his bail conditions, he was not to contact Ms Akhtar. Now, as a result of Greater Manchester Police and West Yorkshire Police having contact with both the prime suspect, Mazoom, and Ms Akhtar before her tragic death. They've referred themselves to the police watchdog, the IOPC. Uh, more information that we got yesterday from police here in Bradford in their um, West Yorkshire Police headquarters behind me was that they've arrested a 23-year-old man in connection with assisting an offender, that they'd conducted several raids across properties in Oldham, Burnley and Chester, where Massam is known to have links, and they've said that they've been combing CCTV. It has been four days now on the search, but the last confirmed sighting of Massam was at 3.42 after he got off a bus near the city centre. He was seen approaching Bradford Moor Park, and after that there's been no sighting, so police are asking people that may have dash cam footage, CCTV footage in the area to come forward, and they're also appealing directly to tax Taxi drivers as well. They believe he may have got into a taxi on Saturday afternoon, paid in cash, and they're asking for any taxi drivers that uh, know of his description. That's been out in the media now. He's described as a slim man, an Asian man. Um, we know as well to come forward. And if he's seen, do not approach him because he may be armed, but to call 999. OK, Anna, thanks very much indeed. And the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, today will announce a new crackdown, if she's elected, on tax dodgers in a bid to help fund the NHS. Now, Reeves hopes to raise over £5 billion per year by the end of the next parliament, which they would use to tackle NHS waiting lists and fund free school breakfast clubs for every primary school pupil. OK, let's get the thoughts of our political correspondent. Catherine Forster on this one. Catherine, good morning. Tell us more. Yes, good morning, Eamon and Isabel. Well, I think this will appeal to uh, most of the people around the country. You, me, GB News viewers have no choice but to pay our taxes and to pay the taxes that we owe. But that sometimes isn't the case because tax evasion, which is illegal, tax avoidance, which is legal, there's plenty of people and plenty of companies that simply get away with paying a lot more than they should. So the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, saying today they're going to spend an extra 550 million, if they get elected, of course, um, given to the HMRC to hire thousands of compliance officers to help crack down on tax dodging. They estimate 
that will bring in another f uh, £5 billion pounds a year uh, by the end of the next parliament. And linked to that, they're also planning to clap clamp down on the non-DOM status, which of course was originally a Labour pledge that uh, the Conservatives have come along and pinched. But Labour are still saying that there are loopholes in that system and they reckon they can get back another two billion or so um, through having stricter rules on that. Um, so all of this, I think, will sound very appealing. The money that they say they're going to save going to fund free breakfast clubs for children in schools, more NHS appointments, some they think will be in reserve. But the problem is, of course, that this is all very much easier said than done. It's the sort of thing that governments tend to say they're going to do. And the reality is that it is not that easy, although the National Audit Office, I think it's worth saying, um, they have said they think there are £6 billion a year that could realistically be recovered. And let's face it, whoever gets into power after the next election, money is in very, very short supply. So if, and it is a big if, they can claw back some of that money, uh, I think that will be welcomed by many people. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Appreciate it. Andrew Pearce from Half Past Nine um, this morning. Andrew, what, what's going to be top of your agenda today? Well, obviously in, in Bradford for this shocking twist mm. in the murder that this um, young man had been um, on bail for threatening to kill. So that's terrible. But also we're going to be looking at Labour's tax pledge. I mean, what timing, isn't it? Rachel Reeves announcing a big thing on tax avoidance when Angela Rayner is still mm. struggling mm -hmm. uh, to uh, answer questions or rather isn't answering mm. questions on whether she did or she didn't pay uh, capital gains tax a few years mm. ago. But you don't know, listen. Uh, look, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. With you. I don't know and I don't care. And how much could she have... How much... I understand the principle yeah, behind yeah. it, but how much, if she was to gain, how much... I, I would just like to know, has she gained £1,000, £10,000, £100,000? About 1500 1500 quid? Yeah. Who cares? The principle. She's Is going to be in deputy government. Deputy Prime Minister? She's going to be Deputy Prime Minister. And, uh, and whether it's £5 million or 5000 you've got to pay your taxes. The real point here, Eamon, isn't even whether she should or shouldn't. Is this she been, has she been lying since this story broke? That's what my point... If I was in her position, I'd have said, I think I might have a problem here. Pay it mm. all over. I'd put, it to, you, I'd put it to you that... The, the system is so complicated. Yeah. Uh, for anybody just even buying and selling a house, whatever she I agree, did. which is why I mean, people would have understood and said, oh, she didn't understand it. I don't think I would have. Mm. So she should have paid, coughed up right at the beginning. Six weeks she's had to deal with this. Mm. It, it's not going to go away. And people well, think what's she's the worst that's going to happen? What's the worst? So, so, so they're elected into government, right? What's the worst going to happen? Is she going to pay a penalty for this? No, what's going to happen? No, I suppose every time she tries to go on about um, people avoiding Budgets taxes, and finances. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. has to publish the legal advice. And I think the fact that Sir Keir Starmer yesterday saying that it was inappropriate for him to yeah, see it... This is a former director of la public prosecutions. Yeah, uh, and the, I think the chair, mm. chair of the Tory party had it right when he said yeah. this morning, this is going to tarnish your reputation. Yeah, but what is. I'm more interested in, and this is the biggest thing that people get away with this, is what Rachel Reeves is going to talk about today. Yeah. This what they're going to do with non-DOMs. Oh, so they're yeah, going to yeah. pay for, for this and that. No, one. <clears throat> the budget for these non-DOMs must be never-ending. However, Amazon and Apple... They never pay uh, a penny. Never pay a penny. So this is my... Never mind Angela Rayner. I agree. 1,500 quid or whatever yeah, yeah. it happens to be. It's these big boys. What's going to happen to them? And they'll say... Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to tax us, you're going to be heavier on us. We'll just take these jobs away. We'll That's go right. and open in Amsterdam yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And and the Tories have kept saying they were going to bring in a tax on these big companies. They never did, and Labour won't either. They're scared of them. Mm. Mm. And they've also got very good accountants, the best lawyers, who run rings around HMRC. It's a game. It's all it a is. game. It is. With that. With that. Um, um, I do have to say, though, when you go up, up the M1, Amazon, when you pass their um, their sheds, their storage areas, they're very neat and tidy. <laughs> well, that's like okay. a neatness well, they've got plenty tidy. of yeah, money, yeah. haven't they? Yeah, yeah, they drive yeah. too fast around me, yeah, the and, van drivers. And, and, I never buy stuff from Amazon, but also they ain't good for the environment, are they? No. Driving around in the lorries yeah. and all these kids ordering stuff yeah. from Amazon. I know. It's a, There's a double standard Blame the Gen Zs on that one. The robots will come in and, and put out, cost well, even more jobs. Well, then they'll be I mean, drones. You're, you're absolutely right there. That is waiting to happen. Yeah. That is what that's going to be. There'll be no people involved in that. No. People won't play a part in that in, no, the, in exactly. the future. Yeah, That's what it's going to be. And will you be talking about Rwanda at all this morning? Word out that these... Uh, Some of the properties are supposed to be going to... Well, they've just, got, they've just got bought up waiting for it, haven't they?
Hilarious, isn't it? Well, it's hilarious. And this is Rishi's, this is Rishi's big idea. Mm. What's his big idea, sir? To, to get the planes to Rwanda, but it, it, some of the, the buildings that the re refugees were going to be put in, the, asy the asylum seekers have been flogged. Yeah, flogged for locals <laughs> instead of for us, <laughs> earmarked for us. We're tired yeah. of waiting. Well, unless they're going to um, rent them out themselves and make a bit of money out of Maybe. it. Maybe. Um, Andrew, we look forward to your programme with Bev, half past nine. Thank you. OK, um, the Great British oh, Giveaway like uh, competition. £10,000 in money, you've got that. That cash comes straight away. The cruise. There's a lot of luxury travel items, whatever they are, associated with all of that. And the cruise itself, the cruise would set you back if you were so paying good. for it. Um, another ten thousand pounds. So, if that if that tickles your fancy, yes, here's how you could win. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. So there you are. What's there not to like? Exactly. Um, stay with us. We're going to go all showbiz. We've got Ellie Phillips in the studio with us after the break. She's going to be talking about the premiere of the new Amy Winehouse biopic, Back in Black. And also we'll be talking about whether or not the Spice Girls could be set for a return. Eamon might have something to say with that because you were with one of the Spice Girls at the weekend. More on that in a minute. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. One more story in. Uh, Milton Keynes, absolute chaos in the city. 300 odd youths arrested or at least involved in a, uh, a big, stampede. A stampede. A yeah, stampede. What, what's been going on? A stampede through the. Uh, there we are. This is the video. So this is a stampede through a uh, shopping centre in Milton Keynes. I think, Amy, you live there, don't you? You live nearby. For those, I mean, on, for I those on radio, we can see literally hundreds, scores of kids. I think kids. they're about 300 kids. Are they in school uniform? S yeah, quite Stuff a lot. Oh, yeah. um, this is as they've security, broken up from school, presumably. Security tried to intervene. They've been accused of being heavy-handed. But I think this speaks to the fact that the landscape of youth services has just been decimated and there's literally nothing for so, kids. So, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think that do. this has happened because social services have been diluted? Youth services. This is because there's no police around, there's no oversight, there's no deterrent, and 300 kids think that they can run through a shopping centre Why frightening shoppers out of their lives. going to a shopping centre? Amy, sorry, my kids, my kids would not be behaving like that because there's no ping-pong available at the local Aren't yeah. your kids, like, youth age centre. four and five? These are teenagers, and our teenagers are headed into a world where there are no leisure services, oh, there are no... It's nothing to do with crime. If we up the ante on basketball, what? it's not going to stop kids being stabbed on the street. What creates antisocial behaviour is having nothing to no, do. It's lack of discipline in the home, lack of discipline in the home, and lack of policing on the what streets, and think? and a judiciary and a penal system that is utterly liberal. You're going right to the end of the line. What about the preventative but measures? What about the people that these people affect by running through a shopping centre and stampeding? When there's right. mothers with kids in prams, frightened out of their lives, and we're worried about the social services I'm aspect talking about that's carrot. perhaps linked You're to talking it. about stick, yeah, right? Yeah. So how long does your solution take to resolve it? Mine takes about 30 seconds. More oh. police, bang them up. Yours... Russell, should parents be fined? More police, bang them up. Uh, absolutely. And the kids should be taken to task.
I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my I'm argument saying? for me. No, what, okay, oh, what, what, person, what, what person? My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, the stars were out last night. It was the London premiere of uh, an Amy Winehouse biopic. It's called Back in Black. And uh, amazing to think it's like yesterday, but it's 13 years Gosh, since her death. Mm. Um, well, let's talk about this with showbiz journalist, friend of the programme, Ellie Phillips, who joins us this morning, complete with her beautiful bump. Woo Good morning to we you. Made it. <laughs> um, Gosh, Amy Winehouse, what kind of biopic? It's not going to be an easy watch, is it? Because the, her decline was really sad, to be honest. Yeah, um, so this biopic has actually got the full backing of her family, so her dad's completely supported it. He was there last night on the red carpet as well. Um, but even before it was released, it was released on Friday, but even before, as it was being made, her friends said, don't understand why this needs to happen. It's exploiting what she went through, her trauma, her tragedy. Um, is it just, you know, capitalising off off what she went through, which is really tragic. And also their fear is that it focuses a lot on kind of the dark elements of what she went through, the ghoulish scenes of, you know, when she overdosed, had a drug overdose in 2008. And they said that those darkest moments, which you do see in the film, are not who she is, and that's not how they remember, and it's not, you know, a full picture of who she is as a person. Mm -hmm. um, it stars Marissa Arbella, who is amazing. If you've seen a, a programme called Industry, she's in that, and she, as acting, she's phenomenal. Um, criticism has come back on her vocals, because she does sing in it. They haven't used Amy's vocals, and people are like, you could have just mm. used Amy's vocals. Aww. They're so hard to replicate. Yeah. Mm. Um, and Marissa isn't have first... You, have you seen... I've seen it? bits of it, I've not seen all of it. I was meant to go last night, how, but... How do you think she replicates? How do you think? So, from what I've seen, I think, um, as, a, as an individual, the mannerisms and who she is a person, great. But even from the trailer, the vocals didn't seem the strongest. Um, and when you have people in the industry yeah. like Ray and things like that, they can do that. Yeah. And I think it is such a skill and a talent to be able to act yeah. and yes. sing. Be as good as Amy Winehouse. To be that good. Yeah. It, because it's a very specific voice as well. You know, it'd be like someone trying to do Adele. Mm. Like, it's a very yeah, known sound. Yeah, but you think of... Um... I'm thinking, was it the Elvis movie with yeah. Austin? Um, Austin I Butler. Name, Austin Butler. And yeah. He was absolutely nailed it. And then you had the the, the Queen one, and you've had the Elton John one. You can do you it. You can. And actually, sometimes I think the singing voice is almost more important than the acting for these big singers. Yeah. Um, I saw Amy Winehouse at the Isle of Wight Festival when she was. Well, actually, I think she was there two years in a row. Or well, somehow I saw her two years in a row, and one year she was sensational. Yeah. And we were all with her every wow. step of the way. And the yeah. second year, everyone was looking at each other. She was clear. Really drunk. Yeah. Um, it was it was really, really shocking. Yeah, quite difficult to um, watch. It was difficult to watch. I think this will be a difficult watch. But I suppose, you know, talking about whether or not it's fair to portray her in the true light. I mean, lots yeah. of films are made like this. I'm thinking of the one about Edith Piaf, who um, was really troubled as yeah. well. Yeah, and Similar I think sort of the voice. thing is, with a lot of these musicians, she was one of the famous um, artists who died aged 27, you know, she, when, when she passed away. And th the thing is about their journey is that their rise to fame and what they go through is never usually easy it's usually you know really difficult so yeah. it is important to show that so. and I think the, it, it does have her family's backing um, it doesn't have her friends backing necessarily yeah. but I think her family are behind it they like it Marissa is such a phenomenal actress yeah. it's a shame she doesn't have the vocals um, but people are kind of saying the, the feedback from people who've seen the entire thing is it's not as bad as you think yeah. um, in mm. terms of the vocals yeah. but the overall I'd be tempted to watch that yeah and also it's directed by Sam Taylor Johnson who directed Fifty Shades of Grey she was there last night with her husband Aaron Taylor Johnson oh, the new Bond he's tipped to be the new Bond ah. as well so they were there on the red carpet last night adding a little bit of glitz and glam that's a theatrical release is it? The yes it's yeah. out on cinemas on Friday okay. back to black yeah mm. Lovely. Right. Now, so, um, the Spice Girls, um, <laughs> you're, you're talking about maybe some other um, get-together reunion on the car? Yeah, so, basically, last month was 30 years, the 30th anniversary of their first auditions, because, obviously, they are the original manufactured girl group, if mm. you will. So, last month, they were very excited about it, and Mel B, being Mel B, is now going around saying, of course we're going to celebrate it, of course we're going to do something together. So, she's teased that they will do some kind of reunion this year. She's put out there that potentially it will happen at Wembley, 
Um, however, there's a big however here. Um, Posh Spice, Victoria it's Beckham. the awkward yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's like, no way, I'm not doing it. But I've got to say, in 2019, when they did their big reunion then, um, I went to see them at Wembley and it was the best day. I will remember that day for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yes, but all they're doing is singing. You know, sorry, yeah. I'm sure it was the mm -hmm. best day, but I'm saying it's, <laughs> a, it's a, such a formula. All they've got to do is to sing their greatest hits and everybody loves it. Yeah. And I'd also say to you, uh, with, the, with the best respect to uh, Posh Spice and whatever, they could do it without her. 100%, and yeah. that's the thing. I think if she was to do it, it would be amazing. No one's expecting her to sing live, but even just to have her up there as that memory of the, you know, the five of them together would be so iconic, because the last time they performed together was the Olympic closing ceremony, mm -hmm. which is so long ago now. Mm -hmm. And I think people would... The, they could probably double the ticket prices if Victoria Beckham was going to come on stage. Is she almost doesn't need it, whereas the no. others possibly do you need it more than her? Well, what makes you I say Mel B needs it? I the suppose very, so. Jerry, very fact Jerry that, Halliwell, not The very fact she was on The Weakest Link with me on oh Saturday, <laughs> I'm sure that doesn't mean she needs it. Uh, I do have to say, well, I was, what, you know, was there with her and she's as fit as a butcher's oh, dog. Yeah. I mean, she looks great and everything's super. Ah, <laughs> oh, that phrase. But um, I was thinking to myself, you know, why does she be doing this for, you know? Do you know what? The thing is, I think she's living her best life now. She went through a yes. lot of trauma with yes. her ex-husband. Yes. And financially, yes, she probably could do with the money. She's been very open about the fact that that when that relationship ended, she was left completely broken financially and has only just been able to buy, buy her first ever home at the age that she is now. Um, and so definitely financially, she's up for it. She's really open about that, and why not? Um, and when it comes to the others, yes, Jerry, Jerry Halliwell's obviously married to someone very wealthy. Um, Christian Horner and all the F1. All the F1 who are. Yeah. Um, so she's not worried about money. But I think it's more than that. I think when you do think, like when you do what we do, when you do what other people do, and you're in the limelight, you're on TV or you're on stage, there's a different point money sometimes doesn't cut it like you know it's great it's amazing it's a huge bonus but I think if you're drawn to that atmosphere and that vibe you would miss it okay. well I would definitely go if there was I would go. I'll go, go together you. yeah I'd go as well <laughs> oh let's do oh, it oh here we go <laughs> thank you Ellie you're thank welcome. you very much lovely seeing you blossoming and blooming yeah, you look oh, thank, thank you very you. much indeed um, um yeah have yourselves a good day, whatever you're up to um, today. It's Bev and Andrew, they're up next. Uh, and we'll be back from six We'll tomorrow. be back from six. In the meantime, here's Annie Shuttleworth with a wet and windy forecast. More of the same for April showers. Have a good day. Bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It's going to be a very windy day for some of us today. There are rain and wind warnings in force and it's also going to be feeling a lot cooler than yesterday, particularly across the east. There's an area of low pressure with wristband of rain wrapped around it. That's bringing the wet and windy weather to many areas. The strongest winds will be across western coasts through this afternoon. That's where we've got the wind warning in force for parts of Wales, northwest England, but also the south coast seeing some very strong and gusty winds. That could bring travel disruption, but it's the rain across parts of Scotland that will likely bring some flooding issues and delays on the roads, trains as well. It will be feeling much colder as well than yesterday. Highs only of around 13 or 14 degrees after temperatures reached the mid-teens through yesterday. However, through tonight, it does turn a lot drier across the country. That area of low pressure pushes away to the east and we have a ridge of higher pressure that will bring much drier, clearer conditions throughout this evening. However, that's going to let temperatures drop down. So we could see a touch of frost in rural areas by Wednesday morning, but it is going to be a much drier and brighter start to the day on Wednesday. Should stay largely dry on Wednesday across eastern areas, particularly across southeastern England. But further west, the cloud will thicken through the day. Rain will arrive across parts of Wales and the southwest through the morning. And that will push into parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Scotland, where it will really linger and turn quite persistent and heavy. There's a rain warning in force for many western areas of Scotland. So here we could see some delays and disruption from the rain. The temperatures will be around average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. <laughs> Very good morning to you. We've got a busy show today. Uh, it's the cast report tomorrow. This is about transgender or children, whether they should be allowed to uh, transition. We're going to be getting ahead of it this morning. The report is out tomorrow. In Bradford, of course, with the new, the new twist on the murder of the 27-year-old mother with her baby, the suspect was uh, on bail for threatening her. Why doesn't it surprise us? Yeah. And Labour on tax, big story. The latest GB News Travel.
Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Train services are suspended between Paisley Canal and Glasgow Central because of a signalling problem. Buses replace trains between Portrush and Coleraine because of a faulty train. And there's a reduced rail service on a number of routes in England because of industrial action. The A1 in Tyne and Weir is partly blocked after a vehicle caught fire on the roundabout at Junction 66 by the Angel of the North causing delays. On the M62 in West Yorkshire, there's a lane closed eastbound where someone's broken down between Junctions 25 and 26 from Brighouse to Chase.